for subscribing. By the way, thank you to everybody who is continuing to subscribe, even as I'm dealing with all this other shit. So, love you guys, love you guys, love you guys. Uh, go ahead right now over to twitch.tv slash night attack. That is where... Monday. Hey, Justin. What's up? Yo, what up? Yeah. Oh, just did you watch? Uh, did you watch Glow this weekend? I did not. No, no. I heard it was very good, though. It's really good. What a girly show. Anybody who watches Glow and binge watches it, I don't know. You don't know uh, that that they're really smart and cool because you definitely called me over the weekend to rave about how Shut great up. Glow. Shut up. <laughs> shut up. I really By the way, I can't stop thinking of the idea that you pitched to me yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, so, I uh, I think the key is to come up with a template type thing to say this is how it starts, and if you want to do that with me, that would be a really cool project. Hell yeah! No, as soon as I can clear some of this uh, this Kickstarter shit off my plate, I would love to actually just sit down with you and, and plot some shit out. <coughs> yeah. Uh, glow's great. I finished it all this weekend. It's uh, it's fantastic. Yeah, I heard, you know, it, it's uh, it's pretty breezy, right? It's only, what, 10 episodes, half hour each? And they're only half hours, yeah, which is uh, a surprising change for, you know, an ensemble show like that. Was, wait, was Orange in the New Black that as well? No, that's hour long. That's hour long, right? Yeah. But it, oh, it's, it's uh, uh, what's it called that's that? Um, Transparent is half hour, right? Which one? Transparent is half hour. Is it? Kimmy Schmidt. Yeah, it always Kimmy feels. Is. Uh, uh, transparent is is half hour, and it always surprises me because it always feels like a an hour long. Yeah. 
Yeah, because that's what I always dug about that format was that like it's the same kind of like ponderous indie stuff that feels so interminable yeah. at an hour, but at a half hour you're like, oh yeah, I'm kind of halfway through. So yeah, there's a lingering shot on a whiskey bottle for twenty minutes. Uh, I did watch uh, the Silicon Valley Would you, uh, finale but, yesterday, and then the more interesting interviews with TJ Miller this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Silicon Valley was a weird finale. Um, did you read the the Hollywood Reporter TJ Miller interview? Uh, I didn't read that new one, but I, I'd read like before the finale aired where he was talking about not knowing he had gotten written off the show. Sideswiped Alec Berg, the showrunner, uh, says he doesn't like him and blames him for Seinfeld sucking past a certain point. Oh, wow. Uh, or more, more succinctly says that that's what he knows. And mm -hmm. so that's what he wanted to make Silicon Valley. Um, and then also kind of sideswipes Thomas Middleditch uh, by saying, well, hey, look, he really he wanted to be the star of the show. Congratulations. You're the star of the show now. Wow. I mean, he's the central character. Yes. yes. And uh, Middle Church's character. I like Middle Church, but Middle, Middle Church's Ditch. character Ditch. I'm Ditch. sick of. I'm so sick of. It, it is just he's become progressively more unlikable and i know i guess maybe this is what the season tried to address but it was like i'm like kind of like over that phase of him but they also never really redeemed it like they they gave him this one little last ditch thing but he never really had to pay for it like you know it, it was it was weird i agree it was a weird season and it was a very weird way to write off uh uh the, the Bachman character and uh, I don't know. It seems like like that that poop got messy. I think the I thing mean, that I'm most happy about is that the uh, the Wi-Fi pineapple got uh, such <laughs> tremendous <laughs> focus. I mean, I think the show the the humor is at its best. I think it's really they've nailed down some of the characters, but it is that I I actually get what Miller's sort of saying. It's kind of like we'll just hit the reset because they're always going to be like this and they're always going to be like that, and you're kind of like. I'm just, I don't need a reset on Pied Piper every season, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I've kind of always been looking for that season where they get into the office and now they have to deal with being a, a, a big boy on a bigger level. And, and well, we had that and they had it for like, for like three episodes <laughs> and then, yeah. and then they couldn't, they didn't want it. They, they like, I guess that's you the know, thing is like, it's always like, Oh, we got to get back to the house. We got to get back to the house. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the show is them in the house. And it's like, I don't think so. I think that the, the show could be them doing a million different things. Yeah, yeah I, I liked, you know, uh, the Jack Barker character. That was great. Yeah. You know, that was that was fun. That was a lot of fun. And I thought he's actually much more interesting than Gavin Belson because um, he's a little more unpredictable. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, I just – I look forward to the next season, but I just wish they just sort of grew. It was like why I just like – sort of just got tired of entourage you know it's like yeah. great you're just gonna keep doing this formula over and over again but yeah. at, a, at a certain yeah. point it's it's nerd entourage i had yeah. i had a similar thing with the veep finale on sunday too of just like oh this is we spent a whole season exploring all these fun different things we could be and then this is what we're setting up again yeah i've not i've not seen it uh but I, I thought this season of Veep was just next level. It's yeah. So. Yeah, and and it's I mean, I ideally they would just do another time skip and get some of this. I've been burned by House of Cards spending two se two entire seasons on elections that I would like to. Like just skip get, to the end. Just get to the good part. Yeah. Yeah. That's a frustrating thing. That's a, that was my frustration of Glow was a, a lot of that could have happened in five or six episodes. And, mm. you know, a lot of this, yes, we, we know where you're going. We know we know what's going to happen here. Let's just get there and know this husband character is not at all interesting or whatever and just get away from there. The sooner the better. And 
Yeah. But and, hey, 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 women wrote the show because I see a woman peeing. <laughs> I love all those scenes where men pee and we're all like, yeah, a man yeah. wrote this show. <laughs> yeah, this is great. We're, that's how we know that we're intimate because we're peeing. How you doing, Brian? Uh, good. Awesome. Nice. Um, well, uh, is there anything, if you need to send me anything, Andrew... You no. Can, you can. Okay. Well, then. No. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, then uh, I think I'm good to go. You guys good to go? We. we... Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, then let's take it away, Andrew, in three, two. Welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Maine, joined by Brian Brushwood. Oh, see, I figured it out. I can have a sunflower seed in my mouth, and then I just tuck it to the side, and it's not as bad as the drinking. Now I'm going to have a drink. Mm. Pro advice. And Justin Robert Young. I, I really wish that I had already preloaded water into my mouth so I could spit it out as Brian had just taken a drink. <laughs> <laughs> Off the panels. Just... What I work with every Monday. This is my life. Anyway, uh, no, I'm doing I'm doing fantastic. You know, just a busy, busy, busy week and uh, uh, a lot of stuff going on. But uh, but I'm excited, excited to to power through. Uh, you know, speaking of excited, how excited would you be if we we're on an airplane flying somewhere at night? Because like one of us got our private pilot's license and that's what we do is we're like flying each other around and we look out. Into the distance, and we see a mysterious formation of lights in the sky. Uh, I mean, like, uh, I mean, I think they're called constellations. We see those all the time. They, they just yeah, uh, yeah, or or they're called uh, uh, buildings, or uh, uh, they're called a, a squadron of enemy aircraft headed towards us. Yeah. So I'm by myself in an airplane. Yeah. And I look out. Yeah. And I see a mysterious formation of lights. It's not a constellation. It's okay. too bright to be that. Unless they all like, you know, like 14 stars went supernova at the same time, Brian. Is that what happened? Is that is that what happened? Um, I mean, no. we can't discount the possibility of it. <laughs> of course, if if that is the case, that's likely the last thing you'll ever see. But, exactly. but what a way to go out. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so you look out there, you see a bunch of bright lights in the sky. And uh, you're like, well, that's that's peculiar. It looks like an unidentified flying object or objects. And so, you know, you do like any sort of pilot do. Just call it in like, hey, I've seen some mysterious formations of lights in the sky. Just want to report this in, blah, 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 blah. Maybe you do it anonymously or whatever, okay? Well, and my guess is like for every one of those that that is not mysterious or, or that is mysterious, there's got to be dozens where people are like, hey, I see a bunch of lights. And then air traffic control says, yeah, that's these four airplanes Nothing to worry about. Okay. True. But in this case, this may have been one of the first reports that led to the Phoenix Lights. I don't know. What the, uh, tell me what the Phoenix Lights are. I assume they're Phoenix. lights over Phoenix. Phoenix Lights is one of the most contemporary UFO cases. Serious, mysterious lights spotted over Phoenix, which uh, some argue. Oh, has been next- now that I'm seeing it. Okay. So it looks like a, a very, very bright uh, line of of um, uh, you know I don't know seven or eight lights all in a in a row. Um, well, now let's not click to any explanations because I want to tell you what's interesting about where the story, the first to report this was. Okay, uh, so but yeah, so keep it, describing. It, and by the way, oh, yeah, um, no, it, it 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 looks as if in a darkened sky you are seeing the massive ridge of a huge UFO. Like yeah. that, that is that is just enveloping the city of Phoenix. If this is the footage that I'm thinking of, um, I'd seen it years ago. And basically you, you p- picture at night, you see a ridge of mountains and over the mountains, one at a time, you just see lights turn on and, and seem to burn. Is, is, that, is that accurate? Correct. Forming a giant line uh, over the horizon. So new details. Now we have maybe an explanation for what that is. Uh, the, of course, the diehards refuse to accept that, and I actually had an interaction with one such person like that. But uh, 
we have a new wrinkle in this. And actually, somebody has kept step forward and said, I was the one that reported this. So I was the first pilot to say I saw this. Whoa. Go on. The first firsthand account of the mm-hmm. Phoenix Lights has now come forward. And it gets really, really strange. Because All right. Let's go. You ready for this? Yep. Let's take I'm going to say, I'm going to tell you right now, it's a famous person. What? It's a famous oh. person. Um, somebody who's a pilot. Oh, was it Harrison Ford? No, <laughs> that'd be amazing though. I mean, because you could just add it to the the catalog of your your favorite story of all time, right? <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, who else has a pilot's license? Um, uh, John Travolta. He loves flying. No, that's a good guess though. Uh, John Travolta's friend who is flying with him because there's no paparazzi. <laughs> John in the sky. Travolta's friend, flying man. Fly person, <laughs> pilot flying man. Uh, no. Uh, can we get a hint? Is it television or movies that we might John know this? John Travolta's wig wrangler. I'm going to tell you right now, this person primarily movies and maybe just was in one of the top movies of the summer. Oh, was it a Kurt Russell? Wait, was it was it Michael Rooker? What's your guess? Michael Rooker. Kurt Russell. Um, Star-Lord's pop himself. No yes! kidding! Yes! Ego. The living planet. That... Flying in his plane back in the day with the wife, Goldie Hawn. I think their son take him to meet a girlfriend. They look out into the... Because that's what rich people do. <laughs> like, we'll take you there, honey. And we'll just fly the plane. Uh, looks outside the window, sees this, calls it in, reports it, and forgotten about it until years later, he heard... Uh, you know, saw some UFO program or something like that. Oh, yeah, that was us. That is amazing. What an amazing life. What an amazing life from top to bottom. Me and so Goldie Hawn and the wife and I, Goldie Hawn, were flying our kid to a date in Phoenix. We saw this thing, and then years later, oh, wow, look at that. It became this international conspiracy. Yeah, it was me, Kurt Russell, who, who phoned it in. Uh,. <laughs> Uh, uh, man, I, I don't know how to... I mean, number one, this is an awesome story. This is an amazing story. Also, anytime somebody remembers being the one, <laughs> uh, uh, especially, what, 20... How long ago was this? 20, 30 years 20 ago? 20 years ago? Would have been 1997. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, I wonder why like this just surfaced. It just seems like... Uh, it just seems like... You know, uh, I, I, I'm sure he saw them, but to, so but to on, claim wait, to so, be the so first. The, 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 the quote uh, that we just saw that, that Neshcom just flashed here on the screen, is that from recording of, of the time or is that him recalling it? Uh, I believe that this is what he called to the tower while he was flying. I'm going to declare it's unidentified. It's flying and it's six objects. Yeah, but is that him... Uh, like it's if there's a recording of it, then said. all then 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 that it's, then that is just an amazing story. No, it's him recalling. It's him recalling. Yeah, it's him remembering what he told the air traffic controller. Right. I, I will. I will tell you that as far as credibility goes, uh, he didn't seem. You know, it, it's not a thing where he's seen hysterical. He saw lights in the sky and like, okay, I'm seeing this, reporting it, and then he seemed to think it was matched up with that date and when that happened. So I don't. It certainly, you know, you have these, you know, with incidents of confabulation, there seems to be a lot more details that people add in there where he's like, yeah, we saw some weird lights. I called it in, said these are six lights. And then we went on about our business and then we're watching a documentary a couple years later and they're like Phoenix Lights. And we're like, wait, we were there, you know, so. Right. Well, so so did this happen just once? I guess I had the impressions that this happened multiple times. Was it a singular incident? The Phoenix Lights? Yes. Yeah. Say again. Once. So, okay. Well, then that's weird. Uh, uh, okay. Well, so he was definitely there and he definitely called it in. But the question of whether or not he was the first, because obviously a lot of people saw it and there's video recording it. Or, or, but regardless, that's awesome that he was there and, and called it in. So uh, the for those of you who want an explanation about the Phoenix Lights, we don't know. It's a mystery that we will never know the answer to, although it looks exactly like when the military does 
testing with flares and like having you know parachutes or dropping flares to test wind speeds etc things like that so those are exactly like flares once you look at it through that lens it's very transparently the case because you see a light turn on and then slowly drift down and then to its left another light turn on and slowly drift down oh wow i guess that's one of those it really tells a different story when they're suspended up there forever than if you know you watch them slowly kind of descend one after another uh well and and uh i was listening to uh, the latest episode of uh skeptoid uh had a thing on on everyone call in and tell your stories of mysterious lights and uh, uh brian dunning was saying that at a at a party he recently heard something he had never heard of before which is whenever um some uh skydivers want to do something showy at night what they'll do is they'll don wingsuits and they'll hold these magnesium flares or whatever bright flare they want. Mm -hmm. And so once that happens, now all of a sudden you have something totally silent that moves in a way that, that, that conforms to no perception of any kind of flying object. And with, with these intensely or intentionally, uh, wild colors and, and spiral patterns and all that stuff they're doing. And of course, it's not like they send out press release or maybe they do send out press releases, but you know, you can imagine not everybody enjoying the feat knows what they're watching. Yeah. I saw somebody, uh, on a, uh, was a, a paraglider or the, uh, the, like a fan, the, uh, yeah, uh, the, yeah. The parasail, I forget what that was called at night. You know, that was a weird thing. And then you just you're trying to figure out what the heck you're looking at, you know, and then you sometimes you see some of these things just out of context. And, you know, I remember driving up Mulholland Boulevard, Mulholland Drive, rather, in L.A., foggy day, rare foggy day. And I look and I see this big row of lights just like close encounters just come up over the hill, side of the hill. Right. And I'm like, holy cow, that's amazing looking. And I'm like, I can't wait for the explanation. I'm sure it's something pretty normal, but I, you know, I'm like waiting, waiting, and then I, I, I pull over to wait, and it's the blimp, or a blimp rather. But it was just, you know, I, a, it was beautiful coming through the fog. I, I probably think I, I took a photo somewhere. That's the thing, right? Is like we are just such pattern recognizing creatures that, like, as soon as we see that jagged little edge, there's there's no end to our curiosity to fill in the details around it. Well. Speaking about jagged edges, let's talk a little bit about conspiracies, gentlemen. Uh-oh. Hell yeah. So uh, I love it when you hear hacking group anonymous. Basically, that means anybody who wants to call themselves anonymous. <laughs> sure. <laughs> we need to we need to do, uh, you know, hacking group diamond club. Maybe not. Maybe that would be a bad idea. <laughs> we disavow any association. Um, so uh, hacking group anonymous. Uh, published a YouTube clip which claims that the government is maybe on the verge of making an announcement by a government, I mean NASA, that we have life. We've discovered life. Okay. All right. Uh, ooh, so, okay. We had actual announcements from actual uh, NASA that, that purported to be discovery of arsenic-based life. And then you look closer and it's like, yeah. Um. I, 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 trusting an anonymous source working for anonymous who claims to have hacked NASA and claims to have figured out that their internal documents claim to have intelligent So life. they said, let me give a little background on this. They said that uh, uh, anonymous claimed the head of NASA science mission director, Thomas uh, Zeruchin, told the meeting this was a U.S. space science, space and technology committee. Our civilization is on the verge of discovering evidence of alien life in the cosmos. Uh, taking into account all the different activities and missions that are searching for alien life, we're on the verge of making the most profound, unprecedented discoveries in history. He said on Twitter, this guy actually, a real person said on Twitter last week, or apparently we're real. Wow, 219 potential new planets. NASA Kepler data shows that most stars are sure are home to at least one planet. Um, so, you know, I don't know if they're taking that as example or saying that because he said this there and there may be something else that maybe they're about ready to announce. It could, it would not be a stretch to say that thanks to, uh, Kurt Kepler, Russell's investigative powers, <laughs> it would not be a stretch. Finally, of, Goldie Hawn has cracked the case, <laughs> <laughs> but she forgot it when the coconut landed on her head. What will they do next? <laughs> Uh, the um, 
Uh, that's not that's not funny. Uh, over seventy people die every year from coconuts falling on their hands. Uh, the uh, <laughs> it would yeah, not be a stretch of inference to say that in the entire history of scientific discovery, thanks to uh, Kepler figuring out how many planets are around, how many stars, we now have more concrete data. So, not that the odds have changed, but our understanding of the odds can indicate that the odds are higher than at any point before that there are lots of planets and possibly enough to, you know, maybe have another set of intelligent life like ourselves out there. So I want to play a little bit of role playing game here, uh, which is something actually we never do here. Uh, <laughs> oh, it's starting now, guys, just so you know. OK, oh, look, uh, wow, it just came an announcement. I just see this on Twitter. It's blowing up. Apparently, NASA has announced that they have received evidence of signal. They've been monitoring the planet. Apparently, this planet has what looks like it could be an auction based atmosphere. And when they've aimed some telescopes and cooperated with some European groups and a, and a whole project they kept very, very secret, they've picked up what seem to be intelligent signals, still haven't decoded them, but they appear to be very much within the framework of transmitted signals. They have regularity to them and maybe carrier codes, et cetera. They have the evidence of life. They think they may have detected life in an intelligent civilization. So, uh, so meanwhile, in Journey Quest, yeah, no, 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 no. The uh, 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 so so it's interesting. Um, I, I remember, you know, when you when you travel around, uh, you go on these these weird philosophical musings when you're when you're in the car with somebody. And a friend of mine said, "Hey, man, what if we really did just knew for a fact that there were aliens out there? What what would that change?" And uh, uh, you know, his point was. You'd still have to get up and, and go make the donuts the next day, I'm right? I'm interrupt you. We've done this. Nothing changes before. I want to do the weird things broadcast now. Right. Well, so so the 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 broadcast. Wait, what do you mean by the broadcast? Everybody well, I'm saying we've had the it. like we've had the sort of yeah. Well, nothing. You just sort of you go oh cool, then we move on. You know. No, so I'm like I'm saying panic right now. Everybody panic. Aliens are here. They're coming for us. Prepare yourself. We are living in a post-alien world. <laughs> This is coming faster than we could have ever imagined. They are, uh, they are, they are, they are here. They are near. Get used to it. Uh, uh, yeah, I guess. I don't know. It just, it, it seems like uh, that. Um, man. Uh, uh, okay. okay. The reason why we shouldn't be panicking right now? <laughs> because they're very far away, and they don't know. Uh, and also because panic is not very helpful in a crisis oh, environment. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Brian apparently has got the alien detector hidden in his butt, and it's not going off just yet. So everybody wait until cool daddy-o Brushwood decides to take his hand off the jukebox and tell us that we need to start getting ready. It's like you're, you're, you're literally freaking out over a flashing light so far away that no living human being was there when it when that light flashed. Oh, wait, hold on. Wait a minute. I just got another Twitter message. Apparently, they decoded the message, and it said that we're coming for you. We're going to we're gonna kill all you. Nah. We're aliens, and we don't care about your human life. We want your <laughs> we want the gold. What, what now, Brian? What now? I mean, I, I'm really unclear what you want from me. <laughs> I want to panic, and you're not letting me. Okay. It seems like we should work really hard on... On building, uh, eating this out. We got aliens. They're coming for us. Duck and cover. <laughs> Duck ADN cover. And... I don't know what ADN means. What does ADN yeah, mean, guys? They're, they're, they're panicking panic, a little too much. They can't spell. <laughs> uh, uh, what What do you think it would be though? Would it be just like a, uh, like it, it would have to be like we know for a fact that there's no natural way. Or I, 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 this is sort of like that alien megastructure thing. At what point does does the flashing of light cease to be like, well, that's curious, we can't explain it, and then and move into territory of like, we are now highly confident that it's an artificial co construct. Yeah, and I agree. I mean, I and I, I mean, I absolutely hundred percent agree on your point that like overall life will still move on. We'll be like, wow, sure, yeah, no, it'll be awesome. Well, and so Spider-Man: Homecoming is coming out next week. My, and by the way, my point was entirely not that it's not a big deal. Uh, my my point was like all of the most prof profound truths that people realize. Um, it it is one that does not often affect the day to day stuff. Like like look at people who have have discovered Jesus, and then you know they are having a profound transformation of their understanding the world and they themselves are experienced the, the the experience of being saved uh that's super profound and huge but also they still have to show up and cover the night shift uh and so like, Brian, what it would like, be lo like that jesus is actually my roommate and he's sitting on my couch right now yeah. <laughs> um 
you you still got to cover that night shift, man. I'm sorry. Unless Jesus wants to do it for you. (laughs) But what you want to be like, uh, well, I want to, I want to, I think I want to know more about this Jesus now. Tell me more, please. Oh, oh, yeah. No, absolutely. If he's, uh, if he's hanging out on your couch, who wants to hang with Diamond J? (laughs) So. Yeah, I, we've talked about this before. How just the the it depends upon how ambiguous the information, the evidence is, is certainly going to affect things. But a and we talked about like what should a reaction be? Contact, not contact, whatever. I I think that the response is in proportion to what evidence there is. If all of a sudden we're getting their HBO and their TV signals and everything else, and we get their Wi-Fi password then it's a very different response than, yeah, we, we, you know, we, you know, we just found evidence of life, you know, in a not intelligent life, but just evidence of life. We'd be like, oh, that's cool. That's cool. You know, that's, that's kind of neat. You know, if we found even within our own solar system, we'd be like, hey, we found some bacteria on Mars. It'd be like, yeah, it's cool. There's other life out there. Well, and then, but I'll tell you, I'll tell you, let's, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, let me just ask you this question. If let's say this is not necessarily aliens are coming to Earth, and any time, maybe even within our lifetime, right? But there is yep. some kind of mega delayed, maybe every year, year and a half, back and forth communication with an alien species. It becomes the biggest story in the history of the planet, right? Oh, certainly. But and and also, uh, here's a tangible thing that even if we never come to understand and we never establish two way communications. Um, the, let's say it is the alien megastructure. We know for a fact that it's blinking and we can now tell like the mere fact of knowing a thing is possible would spark, uh, one of the biggest, uh, uh, you know, uh, explosions of science and technology, uh, in, in the past, you know, history of mankind, basically it's like, uh, um, you know, it took uh, 20 years of practice for someone to juggle, you know, so many objects. And then the moment they did, then posted a YouTube video of it within three weeks, somebody else is doing it too. Because, and not even that they stole the technique. It's just knowing that it is possible now, knowing for a fact that it's possible causes us to, to invest time, energy, and effort in ways that we would normally uh, otherwise do. So like that to me is, is the, is the most exciting part is just knowing that there could be would would fundamentally change the way we allocate resources. Well, and, you know? and, and you know, not not to mention just on every level, right? From space technology on on the level that we're building it now, and space weapons and space tourism, like everything immediately goes to the front of the line. Oh yeah, uh, uh, space escape vessels, arcs, you know, colonizing other planets. Like all of a sudden, that's like uh, that's like real. You know, you're swimming along, trying to swim as fast as you can, and then out of the corner of your goggles, off to the right. You see someone kicking your ass, and then all of a sudden you're like, "Oh no, I got to step it up because this is a race." You oh, know, dude, it's, space it's arc has become the newest accessory. You know, we, when you talk about uh, how our our contact go, went, you know, previously examples, we always like, "Oh well, you know, if we're the lesser developed civilization; they're going to wipe us out." You know, certainly uh, that often is the case. But often, what happens though is is cultures that have really good trading cultures, you know, like the Chinese or the Algonquins, we tend to sort of kind of deal a little bit better with you know the, the ones that had sort of concepts of property rights and well, i'll give you this you give me this we'll make a deal um that was sort of a di- played out a little bit differently so just well, about just saying. the deal the deal yeah uh i just looked this up because i was curious how many stars are there within 10 light years Ooh, that's a good question um, um well, care to take a guess? i yeah. had no idea i generally had no idea i i uh, how how many light? How big is our galaxy? <laughs> uh, I I, I want to say maybe thirty or forty, but I bet I'm way wrong on that. Um, you you I have a guess, say- Justin? Oh yeah, I have. You guys would be the people that I would text if somebody asked me this question. <laughs> so I, I'll go with whatever you guys said. Uh, cosmically, Brian, you're not that far off. Um, it's, it's about according to this report, about fourteen or so. Oh wow! And Including apparently uh, just as recently 2014, an uh, astronomer announced the discovery of an extremely dim brown dwarf around seven light years away. So I guess that's that's big exciting news because you know until we discover some radical different technologies, we have to think in terms of if we're physically going to go to another star, we would love there to be a planet there, (laughs) hopefully something we could do do with. And so uh, you know the closer the better. 10, 10 light years. Wow. But I, I think that I think that we I think the assumption would be I think it's going to be rare if we ever find a star without planets. 
I think that's sort of the point now. Yeah. And, uh, you know, cool. And two is, you know, even with our own system, we're still discovering the possibility of things. There's been some debate as to whether or not the big Planet Nine thing that we thought we may be out there, if that may have been a data glitch now or not, but that's still up for debate. But there's also now a new Planet 10. There's Planet Nine, now possibly Planet 10, which is a Mars-sized object, which may be in the outer periphery of our solar system. Just just a rando Mars-sized rock uh, barely affecting orbits from way out yeah. there. Uh, man, I guess I assume... Hey, so so even though Mars has a dead core... Uh, if you, you have a dead core, Brian. <laughs> if you go deep enough, the Damn. pressure has to generate enough heat. Like, I, 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 at some point deep down in Mars, is it is it room temperature at some point? Oh, not even that far down. Um, if you look at, there are actually surface features on Mars of where they look like, uh, almost look like these radiating spiders, right? Mm -hmm. And what we think that is, is we think that's... Uh, uh, carbon dioxide that liquefies and then spouts the surface and forms ice. And we think it could be geothermal. You could still have geothermal activity on Mars. So, I mean, I guess that's what I'm thinking. Like, uh, I was thinking about, you know, Musk's boring company and, and how we haven't made a lot of advancements in our ability to, you know, tunnel uh, fundamentally. But, like, I guess in theory, you tunnel straight down deep enough, you get warm, so you don't have mm -hmm. to go anywhere. Or, or use any energy to provide warmth, keep on deep going down, you get geothermal activity, so you run steam engines and just, you know, there, you're just living there, on the pressure of, of the of Mars? There's a point at which if you if you dug a hole straight down, I forget how far down it is on Mars, where you'd have Earth pressure. Oh, yeah, I guess so. You uh, could reach the Armstrong limit, which it's probably it's beyond our current tunnel drilling capabilities, but drilling tunnels on Mars is different because it one-third the gravity. Uh, yeah, and I guess you, you really could. You could live uh, – so imagine you carve it out, let's say, a Manhattan-sized uh, something or other, and uh, and it's all uh, perfectly even. You make it beautiful, and uh, and then, you you know, whenever you want, you take an elevator up to the surface. I, I, I wouldn't mind living, living several lifetimes in that kind of thing. Well, I mean, just as easy, probably just for the amount of effort for that, though, there are more than likely – uh, lava tubes on Mars that are dwarf anything we have on Earth because of just the this, the the scale of the volcanic activity they've had Olympus uh, Mons and what would happen because again less gravity you can get bigger so there are we have we've seen what are called riles which are sort of these collapsed lava tubes on the surface that are kilometers long and so there's we know and we've seen the entrance points we've seen holes or what they call skylights where we look down in and we know there's a big cavern underneath there. And we think even even on the moon, the possibility of there being massive lava tubes there too that you could put inside of there. So I think I think the first big the first big colonies we put on Mars are either going to be in these riles where we just dome some of them over, or completely underground ones where we just block them off and then pump it full of air. Basically, yeah, cork cork it. Mm -hmm. uh, but the idea that you could go down far enough and not even have an airlock. Can you? Can, oh wow, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, that's right. It would be it would be just like I mean, you know, we don't have an airlock between here and the top of Mount Everest. <laughs> you just go uh -huh. high enough, and all of a sudden, you can't breathe. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, Jay Calhoun means we could just dome over uh, Valles Marineris or something. I agree. There's a lot of these radiating valleys from there, and I think that when you start thinking about before we get to the long term idea, if we ever terraform Mars, we're going to be doing a lot of that kind of inhabiting, taking natural structures, modifying, and also getting the idea of. How do you how do you how do you use this landscape but not make it too big, much of an eyesore and impact on it because that legit will be a big question people on Mars will be asking. Oh is, yeah, well, as a matter of fact, uh, Kim Stanley Robinson's Red Mars, Green Mars, Blue Mars series. Uh, ironically, you you know the big debate is between the Reds and the Greens, and the Greens are the industrialists who are like, no, manifest destiny. We're meant to remake Mars in our own image, and 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 Reds, you know, these geologists are like, there's so much natural beauty to Mars. The, with these rocks tell such a story. We can learn so much. Why are you ruining the planet by making it green and lush? Uh, and and of course, the book does a great job of making it a, a not a silly debate, but instead, you know, mm -hmm. something that people are willing to go to war with each other over. Uh, speaking of going to war, we go to war every episode of Weird Things. War with the truth. 
Yeah. With, or with uh, the truth or uh, truth. Oh, along with, with the, the truth th by our side, oh, Brian. Got, got it. Okay, good. Uh, listen, <laughs> go uh, uh, this is truth, uh, our new the messaging. Truth. There's a war for your mind happening right now. Uh, it's an information skirmish. Informationskirmish.com uh, is not a website we own, but I'm sure somebody could buy it. <laughs> if you wanted to go to patreon.com slash weird things, that's where the, uh, the, the, the battle for your brain <laughs> takes place. <laughs> the battle for the wet wear between your ears happens here. Uh, yeah, man, uh, head on over to patreon.com slash weird things. Please join the ranks of the proud. Um, uh, what, are, what are some of the benefits we got? We're working on carving out a journey quest. Uh, we are only $110 away. So if you've been on the fence, if you've enjoyed the show, then please, please, please kick us a buck an episode. Please. Hell yeah. Uh, gentlemen, we had a very exciting weekend for SpaceX. Uh, yep. Boy, you're not kidding, man. You're not kidding. Within 48 hours, we had two SpaceX launches, one from the East Coast and then another from the West Coast. Back-to-back uh, -back launches, both landing the boosters again. And it was incredible. And also what they did on the, the rocket that landed on the uh, West Coast used the new upgraded grid fins. Those are the things that look like kind of the, the tennis racket, sort of waffle iron type things that pop out on the side that help the first stage guide itself back down to ground. Uh -huh. And they'd had problems before because sometimes, I don't know if you know this, but I've been following Elon Musk's Twitter account, and apparently rockets sometimes come back really, really fast. Yeah, I've heard yeah. that about rockets. Yeah, and so they were using these grid fins before, which were made of aluminum, and there are points where you could see these things just start to bit to glow because oh. the amount of wind pushing through them and how you know how intense that was. And they had to like resurface them or repaint them or do whatever. So they switched to on the new rocket, titanium ones. So they use these titanium grid fins, which are a bit bigger, but a bit bit heavier, or you know than what they were using before. But apparently, was a, a bigger advantage to what they had. And uh, so they're working towards looking to make every single part of the rocket reusable. And that includes, oh, you know, this thing that if we don't have to repaint these or resurface these, that's an advantage that we can, you know, t you know, utilize. So it's it's kind of awesome that we had just, you know, within 48 hours back to back. And their goal is next next year. They'd like to try to do a rocket a week. Wow. Uh there's and a the funny thing is I know it's not the point of his entire enterprise or his life, but the fact that he just has the most baller Instagram of all time is such an amazing <laughs> uh, like yes. like subsection of, of what he is doing because uh, it is just like who else? Who else can compete with Elon Musk in, in the IG game, right? Boy, you're not kidding. Oh, yeah. Uh, but, 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 uh, Andrew, I heard that Elon Musk is just a government swindler. He's uh, over promise under delivered. Uh, there was actually a really good article that I read this morning on, uh, ARS Technica. That's, uh, the title was after nine launches in 2017, it's tough to be an honest critic of SpaceX. And basically it, it was a greatest hits of all the things that, um, uh, naysayers from within, uh, and and they they admit you know yeah no his manifest did show sixteen uh, on the schedule and then you know in two thousand sixteen only uh, did hold on, let me get the numbers correctly um, so it would have been nine I think in two yeah it sa well it says here uh, uh, it's a bit frustrating for us to be frank uh, this is album said at the time I think he was a ULA uh, representative he says there's data to be in mind and he gets a bit of a pass on the performance if you look at the beginning of this year his manifest showed 14 or 15 flights and 14 or 15 next year I think he's had two now this is previously but now we're halfway through the year and he's already got nine two in a weekend and uh, and 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 intention of going weekly, it, it there may have been a window where naysaying was a comfy, safe place to be, but it doesn't look like that's the place now. You know, it's they're the upstart and they're doing things differently. And by rights, you need to question different, particularly when it comes to something as important as is at the scale this is. And and SpaceX's you know pattern of let's move fast and break things is often delivered on both sides of the promise. And it, it's a, but it's also that some of the, what's frustrating to me has come from people who've been critical without having the information like, Oh, you know, they just government subsidies. It's like Boeing, Lockheed, every other rocket launcher. Yes. Everybody, they do the same thing. Every other rocket company does. 
they get government contracts. The exception is ULA was getting about a billion dollars a year, even if they didn't launch rockets. SpaceX never got that. You know, SpaceX was getting for delivering things. And guess who the biggest purchaser of rocket launches is? It's the government. And that was the same with computing in the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, you know, and it's like, yeah, it's like these are it's not that it's not an industry that, you know, where government's a big part of it, it is a big part of it. But they've been putting so much of their own effort into reusability and doing things to try to push it forward. Yeah. So, well, so it, it's uh, that. Uh, it says here uh, through April 16, SpaceX had launched uh, the Falcon 9 22 times for paying customers. And 12 of those launches were some form of government. However, now, uh, during the last 14 months, SpaceX has flown 15 times and only four of those have had government payloads. So it's yeah. like, uh, uh, even if, if, if you want to ding on that, that's trending in a in a uh, pro-commercial gen. Well, and, it, and it's because it's part of it's who it's the, so we launched on Friday was the Bulgaria sat, okay? And, uh, you know, Bulgaria, noted contractor of space services, right? Hmm. They couldn't <laughs> afford it before. They, they couldn't, and they were like, yeah, no, we was, you know, for us to have our own satellites, a big deal, and now we get to have our own satellite. And that's what's happening is because of the, re they said, well, we can fly in a reusable, like, Oh, and it's, it's a sort of weird thing like, oh, you're just dependent upon government. Yeah, that's the primary buyer when 70 or 80 percent of the market is the government because of where prices are. It's a silly sort of criticism to go like, well, you're mainly selling to the government. It's like, yeah, who sells, you know, who buys the most handcuffs? You know, it's just, well, <laughs> I don't know how <laughs> things are where you guys live. But anyhow, my point is that who buys the most tanks, you know, uh, and that's changing. That is dramatically changing. And, and the argument I bring up again, it's. It's like this, you know, the statement was made by it was it was like, I think the head of DEC deck computers in 1970, where he's like, well, the computer market's just like a bunch of insurance companies. There's really not a market beyond that because they were selling at that point. A DEC computer was a room with a bunch of different machines. That was what a computer was. And we're a year away from the microprocessor in 1971. And the idea that you would fit it all into one small device and that that would be useful to other people. Alien, totally alien rockets are in that phase change right now where it's like, well, you know, there's not much market for it. It's like, yeah, at, you know, $80 million or previously was $300 million a launch or $200 million a launch. Yeah, surprising. There's not much market for it. See what happens when it gets down to 20. So uh, what do you think the the up um, the maximum bandwidth of launches, uh, SpaceX, let's, let's, you know, totally rosy projections or whatever. Um, obviously, you can't do two a weekend every weekend, or can you? Um, I, I wonder, I mean, obviously, uh, and I, I don't want to say obviously, because whatever I say, obviously next will be wrong. Uh, do, do you have a guess based on what you know they're doing? So the fact that they were able to do two in a 48 hour period shows that they have two different teams working to do launch cadences and all that. Now, the next question is, is how, how many people do you need per launch to be able to supervise? How does that change over time? Part of it also is launch facilities. They had, we have, they were able to launch from Vandenberg and they're able to launch from uh, Kennedy. So there is, there's two, there's Kennedy and then there's Canaveral. So there's two launch pads there, right? So when they do Falcon Heavy, I think that's going to be, that'll be from Kennedy, right? So there's two launch pads that we have in Florida. There's a launch pad in Vandenberg, which they've been using. They're building the Boca Chica, which is in Texas. So they're building another launch facility in Texas, which will provide them other capabilities. So they're going to have three three major launch facilities with at least four pads so far uh, has uh, has has anything uh, uh, has anything flown to orbit from texas before is that a new thing no not yet uh, uh no no but i mean if they did it would be the first time yeah yeah, yeah it wow. would be that would be the first your yeah your primary launch facilities are vandenberg Kennedy, uh, Canaveral, Wallop Island, which is near Virginia, where a lot of like you'll see some of these other like military satellites go from. And there's like a place like an Anchorage or something like this or some weird northern thing. So part of your reason you have these different places is you use them for different orbits. Got you it. launch from because when you when they take off, they've got to go over the ocean. And so if you want to go east west, you, of course, go one way. You want to go west east, you go the other. Or if you want to do a polar orbit. You actually generally you launch from uh, Vandenberg because you're going to go you want to go over uninhabited areas. Oh, so. yeah. I, I didn't realize I'm just now looking at where that facility is like that is as as south as Texas gets. Huh? That's right there mm -hmm. on the Mexican border. The, the SpaceX facility. Yeah. Boca Chica. Yeah, that's going to be and that might be 
you know, might become like a major one because that'll be one they control. That'll be the one that'll be totally up to them that they'll have oversight on. So as far as their ability to increase the cadence, if they're going to, they may be doing 52 launches next year. And so that's going to mean, you know, you have to have your, your teams in charge of that and being able to facilitate, you know, making sure that each thing goes through there. And, you know, they're, they are extremely, you know, they know that another accident could be very problematic for them. Yeah. You know? Well, it's, it's, uh, uh, I mean, it's great that they recovered, um, you know, as well as could be expected from that one, but, uh, but you know, the pressure's on, they would be, it really would be devastating to, to have another massive failure. It would be certainly, but I think that, uh, it's, it's, uh, I don't want to say, I mean, I, Elon Musk is a very determined guy and you know, there's a lot of amazing technology there. So we want them to continue to have success, but, and I, I agree. Yes, it would be very, very in, in, in the, the, the prognosis is like, Oh, this could destroy them. But like, um, I, he's one of their people. I say that, you know, public figures and stuff. I'm like, I will not bet against them. I will not bet against, you know, their tenacity or whatever. So, you know, and it's, it's, Great. And I mean, exciting, though, like with, you know, Blue Origin, by the way, has announced they're building a facility in Huntsville, Alabama, where they're going to be producing rocket engines there for their contract with ULA for the Vulcan rocket. Um, so, you know, it, it's a very exciting time is where things are going. So um, I want to show one more tech thing, which is kind of cool. And if Bryce could pull us up, The Verge had a cool thing today. It was an article showing Apple's AR kit and what people are starting to do with this. This is a software layer or an application interface if you want to develop software for the iPhone that will be coming out in the next iPhone update. And developers right now have been playing with this. It's really cool for making objects appear in the middle of space, whatever. But there's an example of showing you, like, really thinking about what's the potential of this. And uh, there's a video we're watching right now, and it shows a tape measure on the ground from an iPhone point of view. And a virtual dot, virtual like ping pong balls put at different points on the tape measure. And oh, it, shit. Expletive. So you aim the iPhone, you find a point like this point, it's like a lacrosse stick. You put these dots on there and it's showing you the distance between them. That right. Uh, that now is, go down below there. There's another one that's that's uh, really cool. Watch that, this. That is so tangible. That's such a great idea. We're watching a virtual tape measure unfold next to an actual tape measure. And it's utterly precise. It's, it is it's like exactly an inch off or so. Down. Oh, wow. I yeah. think it's from the starting point of where the, 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 the word started from. So it's this. So they, they, there was a tape measure laid down on a dining room table. They took the phone, aimed it at the top of it, and then as they moved the phone along, it like digitally unfurled a tape measure next to this, the same exact length of that. And as they stepped back from the table, you could still see the tape measure just hanging there. Uh, and, that is extraordinary. And uh, uh, remember when we were first talking about this, I was I was struggling to think of concrete examples in the short term. In the long term, we all agree it's going to be amazing. Mm -hmm. But this this is very eye opening in that regard. That's something I it, could see. Yeah, it, it's easily. it's the beauty of putting a kid out there and letting people play because then you're like, oh, I see this, I see this, and that precision, the, the fact that it has that precision with an off the shelf iPhone. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, and, and think about how many, um, uh, how easy it will be to visualize certain things. I mean, certainly you can imagine that, uh, uh, you know, if you have a building that is uh, being renovated or whatever, it's like, you know, just uh, scan this QR code and then uh, and then look at how the completed project's going to look and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, any IKEA's, kind of IKEA's unloading, uh, unveiling an app that'll let you, you know, use plan with IKEA, put IKEA furniture mm -hmm. around there and see how it'll look to do with a remodel on that. Um, I like the idea if you go to your friend's house, like, man, I hate that painting. I'm just going to put my own thing there. Ha! Yeah. Um, but yeah, that, the, the, the tape measure thing alone, that lo little thing right there that's like that you could do that and somebody already has a cool tape measure app just with putting these ballpoints there. And it's just the beautiful thing. It's like they, they put this, they look at the phone, the phone's aimed down, laying on the ground. They put the different points there or the one of the actual tape measure where you look at the tape measure on the table. And then they just step back and sort of tilt the phone around and it remembers where in space that thing still is. The persistence of that is just incredible. One of the yeah. frustrating things, a lot of ARs, you, you've done the things where you have the one where you need the, uh, the uh, image to tell you where it is. And then if you give it out of frame, it just blinks away and it's no longer persistent. Or, oh, yeah. You know, the, those like uh, low resolution, they look like QR codes, but basically yeah. like, you know, this is the anchor to, to yeah. put that on. Yeah. 
Oh man, Dude, what that's time amazing. Is it? I mean, I'm I'm I am super pumped for that, especially with whatever hardware the new iPhone has, which will probably make it kind yeah, of. Yeah. Speaking of, speaking of which, when are when are we expecting announcements? Uh, Septemberish, I'm guessing. Probably. Yeah, usually that's usually about when when they're gearing up for uh, for the Christmas season, you know. Yeah. How far? This is a bit of a morbid thought, but um, but I was wondering to myself, like at some point, it seems like they'll want to they'll they'll have such an advance and that they might want to break away from the numbering system on the iPhone. And I was like, what would they call it if it wasn't a number? And I realized that it's been it's it, it's potentially been long enough since the death of Steve Jobs that like I could totally see you know the, the new iPhone Jobs and j- like that's just what it is it's like uh how far how far off do you think we are from something like that or is that too too He would have hated that and they know he would have hated that I I, yeah. I I don't discount either of those statements also yeah. how long till it happens Well I'm saying they know he'd hate it I I don't think this generation of Apple would do that Yeah No I I think that yeah it would be you know, maybe in in years and years when they're finding when they need new names for all their operating systems or something that that, you know, along with Martin, you know, <laughs> uh, OS King and OS Einstein and OS uh, uh, Lenin, you know, the, the <laughs> Lenin. Bill. The Beatle, the Beatle. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was the like, I was like, a lot of cultural changes between now and this future points. <laughs> you want to know uh, what? Good, good. Yeah, let, let's go with, with with McCarthy, the Beatle, not the uh, senator. I will. I'll give you a, a thing to think about, and and a, I'm going to compare him to a historical figure at the risk of people going, "Oh my God, I don't believe you just compared it with so and so," but I will. Founding father of our country, George Washington, was pretty adamant he did not want statues in his honor. And so that's why Washington Monument is an Egyptian obelisk. You know, it was he was a guy that's like, listen, new nation. You know, we don't need to deify our people. We don't need to do this. Let's just let's just make a great nation. We're getting close to the unveiling of the Apple mothership, Mm -hmm. which is the campus, the Apple campus. And if you look at some of what that looks like now, it is an amazing piece of architecture. And uh, Wired Magazine. What's that? Andrew and I were there when it was a parking lot. <laughs> but yeah, we, we found what we assumed was the center of it and stood there. So the Wired magazine had a great cover, which was they showed this. And then the caption was one more thing because Jobs was and, and there's the thing that you can see this with Elon Musk, too, where you build the thing and then you become very obsessed with the way you build the thing. And that's with Musk's gigafactories. And that's why he's looking at like, hey, here's what's stopping me from making these things a reality. And with Musk, it's like. I have supply chains. I have factories. I have these limitations on getting the things out of my brain into the world. So with with Steve Jobs, it was this, how can I improve the way that Apple itself works? Because we're per, certainly factories are part of it, but the real heart of it is where they think these things up and design the software. So the new Apple headquarters, which is this an amazing, huge, humongous building that that's a big part of who Steve Jobs was. That's that's the Steve Jobs. I think a big part of his legacy is is that so. Um, but yeah, as far as, you know, when it becomes the iPhone job, listen, they hit hard times. Anything's possible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Our new digital assistant, Steve, <laughs> uh, ask Steve, <laughs> uh, it's, uh, yeah, but as far as the naming conventions too, is Apple's tried to avoid for the most part, they got, they did, they looked at the disaster of the nineties with the, the, you know, the back LS to see what I'm like, I don't know what those mean. Mm-hmm. And, and they try to go for simplicity's sake. So. Uh, we'll see. We will see. Meanwhile, Although they have they have with the iPhone slipped more into the S's and C's and stuff like that. They dropped so. the C for the most part. They did. They did. But yeah. but they flirted more with it than they had in the past. You know. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. And I think they sort of said maybe we shouldn't. But yeah, uh, that was you know interesting. Uh, and it's gonna get gonna get very very curious because I think now. Um, uh, Google looks like they're going to get more involved in trying to control hardware because Apple's Apple having you know their own control of their chipsets and what goes on there. It's why these phones consistently are the fastest ones there, even though you know there are more Android phones sold. It's just that Apple has such a you know such a technology base to build that on, and that's why you're getting things like this AR kit and stuff. And what's going to happen? It's, it's going to be very interesting times. Well, th- so. There's also uh, you know a side effect of them 
doing uh, there are multiple side effects to, to keeping it a walled garden like they do. One is that they they have a high margin system, right? They there's a reason they're the richest company on the planet, and uh, it's not because they're they're barely making money on each unit. But another side effect is that they get to invest a monstrous amount of energy into stuff like AR Kit, and I'm sure there's a billion other speculative projects. But a, a very tangible, practical thing along the way is uh, I was listening to. Uh, it was in the context of political discourse and about safety of your uh, information. Uh, I think it was maybe on Sam Harris's podcast. He had, uh, you know, somebody who uh, deals with dissidents in various political areas where, you know, it's easy to compromise and know what the people are saying. And and her number one advice out of everything, she said that I don't hear from anyone. Nobody says if you care about security and privacy, get an iPhone because you can't, uh, you know, while individual uh, uh, Android devices, maybe very secure, super secure, whatever. Just in general, as a platform, her opinion was that uh, was that the uh, the iOS environment had uh, inherent security features that were. Oh well, better. they they I don't and I don't think it's being fanboyish. You know, they take that it's it's a it is a pri it is a primary part of their product that they consider highly and very very important to them because they. They go to extreme points like when like I've been working on a, a an app that uses voice dictation and they anonymize that string of data when it goes to the server. It goes there. It comes back. They the Apple does not know who that came from. Right. Apple does not know. You know, they might know how many pings, but they don't know what the data itself is. Apple does not build a uh profile of you they don't have a voice profile sitting on a server somewhere they go to great great links to try to avoid that because they want to avoid knowing anything about you they, they, they consider because they're not they're not an advertising company google's an advertising company and that's what it sells so google's value increases the more they know about you and and that's what they do and they do it well but it, and so what apple's like no we, and that's why like things like apple had iads their ads thing which one was poorly named but two was like was never that effective as other ones because they're they just when they're saying no we don't really want to get that invasive um they kind of handicap themselves in that remark remark space but the other hand it's why they're extremely build like security from the very very core of it is very important to them so um you know, they take it seriously. I'm looking at like uh, on the coding level, how separated every single thing is, how everything's handled like that. Uh, and by, know, by the it, way, before anybody uh, has, if you if you've halfway written an angry email calling us Apple fanboys, like that's fine. I'm just saying, to, I, I was I was interested to hear that uh, flat pronouncement about security. Uh, which which I did not perceive uh, it to be in here. I'm not going to shy away. No, there have been far more exploits on Android for that, a lot more malware. There's been attempts by state agencies to try to crack the iPhones. They've had some successful exploits on it, but it's been much harder. It actually is a more secure when it comes to your personal information. I will flat out say this. Email me away. Tell me I'm wrong. I stand by this. Oh, snap. <laughs> Getting I'm ready. just because we're we're like, oh, but we know, oh, we know there's certain fans, we won't name them, they get more even more angry. I'm like, well, we can pretend that that's not the case, but I'm going to say it's the case. Mm -hmm. So uh, what, what's that email, Andrew? Where should people direct their email? Uh, Neshcom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and I think they all take it seriously. Me, they, all, they, all, they all take it seriously. But it, it, it's a thing when you look at how Apple goes to the point of anonymizing your search requests, you know, even tokenization, what they do through tokenization from everything that goes to their server and all that, you know, they, they do not try, they do not build profiles of you, you know, um, and again, uh, I, we could get into a longer discussion about this, but I will, I, I will tell you that it is a very much at the core level. It's a very, very different thing. And you could say there's not a search history. Apple, Apple does not have a, a subpoenable search history of you. Like, Google does. Oh wow! So. Uh, and, and I mean, again, it, it's it's the fundamental business model of the mm -hmm. of the two companies, right? Is, yep. is, exactly. You know, yeah. Apple wants to sell you hardware, and Google wants to sell people the opportunity to put ads in front of you. Yeah, and you know, and you know, you are everybody's upfront about it. You know, I, I will rip into like Google and Facebook as sort of like just be aware of this is how invasive it would be, and this is what they know, but it's. You know, that's the problem, you know, and they just said Google announced they weren't scanning. Your, they're not no longer scanning your email. And that was that was a misunderstood program. That was where it was done locally, whatever that wasn't. They weren't building databases of what was in your email there, whatever. And so I was big defender on Google on that one, because, 
you know, people didn't understand what that was. But anyhow, gentlemen. Yes. Uh, where were we? We were <laughs> in the middle of Journey Quest. Yeah, Journey Quest. Oh. Oh, <laughs> uh, yes. Anyway, we're about. To, I don't know. Do we have a previously on or? Uh, we do. We we do. I forgot about it. Oh, okay. No worries. Um, okay. Previously on Journey Quest. Okay, just 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 wait. I'll I'll, 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 I'll pull it up. Uh, Journey Quest is of course wait, our wait, weekly wait, 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 adventure uh, series. Oh, sorry. Bryce was telling you to wait. Well, he can explain it. That's fine. Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, Journey Quest is our weekly adventure series that is uh, uh, brings us into the mind of Andrew Maine. Uh, we uh, we will obviously find out where we were before in our little recap package, but uh, Brian and I constantly on the run for our lives. We, we initially were just trying to navigate a post-apocalyptic society, and since then we have gone on all kinds of adventures uh, through time and space and we now find ourselves in a world that we, we, we don't know where amongst uh, any of our friends and enemies we really are. It's a dangerous dark times as our journeyers, our journey questers have journeyed into journey a very <laughs> journeyous territory <laughs> All right, filled with. Oh. Are we there? Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. We're yes. ready. All right. Oh, okay. Previously on Johnny Quest! Whatever you do, when he asks you if you want to play Ugg, be sure to tell him, Hey, I'm back, guys! We're gonna have to play Ugg, aren't we, Justin? I think we're gonna have to play Ugg. Gentlemen, you are about to embark upon the greatest game ever, the game of Ugg. Blindfolds, please! <laughs> All right. So uh, you've agreed to play the game of UG to be accepted into this tribe because it's either join the tribe or go into the jungle and face such foes as <laughs> it was. I never. I remember the word rape was in it, <laughs> and and that was all I needed to hear. We had the raping spiders. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We had. The uh, molesting sloths. Mm, oh, that's right. Slow, slow motion agony. Yeah. Yeah. So we have uh, come upon a group of humanity. They seem relatively friendly, but with strange customs, including the game of Ugg, which we are not uh, particularly familiar with. But now we are going to play despite a possible warning that we should or should not definitely <laughs> play the game. So you've been blindfolded. You were led into, I think, another another lodge or something like that, right? And uh, you're about to have the blindfolds whipped away. Your blindfolds whipped away, okay? And there, standing before you, tall, standing, like standing tall, standing tall, totally not stalling here, standing before you, is a guy in a referee's uniform. Oh, uh, I, 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 what does he look like? He, he looks like a normal human, right? Yeah, he looks like a referee. He's got just like a referee, referee shirt, referee Who shirt. Who is right? the celebrity he most resembles? The celebrity he most resembles. I'm going to say he kind of most resembles uh, maybe a boss hog from Dukes of Hazard. <laughs> okay, yeah. right. <laughs> an, an older gentleman. <gasps> yeah. So he's like, but younger, a younger version. He was, you know, he was, you know, Boss Hog wasn't always an old sure, man. Sure, so cl closer to kind of a George Costanza looking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Like, all right, gentlemen. Ah, we got some new players here for Ugg. Mm. Yeah. I, I, I start fist pumping with my one good fist and say, uh, uh, yeah, man, we love Ugg. Uh, well, I'm, I'm not going to. Uh, I'm not going to play around here. I have no idea what Ugg is, so can you go ahead and uh, just spell out the rules here so uh, we can uh, fit in? Rules of Ugg are pretty simple, gentlemen. You're going to have right. to survive. Uh, oh. Uh, okay. Uh, so when you say survive, do you mean like a uh, – like a, like a, 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 Stay in a, the game, like dodgeball? Or like, a, like a, what's the musical chairs, like a musical chairs kind of survive? Like be the last one with a seat? Points to a doorway and says, I'm going to go outside. 
and only one of you is coming through that door. Uh, okay, look, I, I, we've heard this song before. I, I, can't we just do a trivia contest or or uh, 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 us versus the world co-op? Don't you have a co-op version of UG? Only one of you is coming through that door. Is like Come back in, in 10 minutes. 10 minutes or if you both are here. See the chambers? See those spigots on the wall? It's gas. It's gas. It fills with gas. Uh, okay. Wait a minute. Two Hold men on. try to so walk this... out that door. Two men try to walk out that front door. Got bayonets. Uh, okay. Well, hold, hold on. Uh, 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 so what if what if we just you know cordially allow walking one of... out? He's walking away. <sighs> All right. The door. Door closes. Justin, look, we've been in these situations uh, wait, before. Wait, 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 wait. I, I try to run uh, out before the guy gets out. <laughs> And as you get to the doorway, you see what may be a guy with a big machete staring back at you. Uh, I, I I say, uh, well, I was just going to say, Justin, uh, I've been the irresponsible one so many times on these journeys. I, f I feel like, I mean, let's face it, my Darwinian fitness is not the best, even in this hyper real, real extra dimension. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, I don't see any need for us to fight. You could just go. You're the winner of UG. You, you you just head on through that door, just just go on through the door. Winner of the game. What what are you what are you, are you saying? I'm an asshole or something? No, like, no, I'm, like, say, I, I'm, I'm saying I, like, oh man, I, I'm, uh, I'll tell you what, I, it's a great it's a great place for you to be buried, Brian. So so lofty on your high road, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, you'll, you'll be able to just look out onto all the commoners from your grave. That'll be really good for you. Well, I mean, let's face it. I've made some really bad decisions. I mean, the least I could do is try to balance the scales oh, here. Oh, no, just martyr, martyr McBrien over here. Just uh, like, oh, no, I'll die for your sins. <laughs> like, uh, just do me a favor. Can you just, like, wear a gold chain of me with one hand to remember my sacrifice, wait, right? Hold on, hold on. You know what? Now that I think about it, uh, yeah, I, I, wait, wait. There, there might be some latent, there might still be some magic in those old Nazi implants that I once had. I haven't, I haven't tried to access Adolf since, uh, uh, and I was, I was like, uh, Adolf, <laughs> are you there? Uh, go away. <laughs> well, hold on, Adolf. You're still, you're still active? Your you subroutine's still running? I'm sorry, Adolf is unavailable until you connect to a Wi-Fi network. Oh, damn it, damn it. There's no internet in this reality. Um... Wait, I also was God briefly. <laughs> I try to access some godlike powers. I look at my stump and and think, grow a hand. No, mm -hmm. no. <laughs> well, please try again to access godlike powers when you're a <laughs> Wi-Fi network. <laughs> I turned to Justin. I was like, well, I mean, I gave it my best. Uh, God, say hello to. You looked at your. You looked at the ground twice. That was your best. <laughs> You didn't say a thing. You didn't communicate with me. You thought you closed your eyes for four seconds, and that's it. Well, I guess. I mean, this is what this is what's great about you, Justin, is you bring out the best in me. Uh, maybe we could look around and see if there's an escape or literally anything other than that one door. All right, here's the deal. Uh, I, I'm not playing these games. Uh, I'm not. Either we die together. Or uh, or we both get out of here. So so that's 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 how I want to do it. I was gonna actually suggest that I just walk out, but until you brought up this whole, you know, like you know, <laughs> let's start a new religion based on Brian BS. Uh, you know, I, I now I'm into this we both live thing. <laughs> well, okay. Uh, uh, I I wish I could say this was a clever use of reverse psychology, but I was just trying to do the right thing. Just so you know, this wasn't like you know, it wasn't. Oh, game I know. Hey, look under yourself. Uh, judge me by my deeds, not my <laughs> actions. Yada yada yada. Okay, fine. We get now it. You, You're Christ. You notice to the side, there's actually an air vent. Ooh. Uh. Hey, Justin. What about this air vent over here? Yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and try to rip off this air vent. And we can you rip it off. There's a there's a conduit there. Ah, uh, climb through. Uh, yeah, I I I try to climb behind him. I say, right. smell you later, FOs, as I uh, as I climb into the air vent. <laughs> also, uh, also, climb... if is, is 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 UG a popular game? I would have thought there would be an audience or or somebody watching. You're climbing but... through. You're climbing through the vent. You're climbing through the vent. You're climbing through the vent, and then you see another vent. You see what looks like jungle outside. Uh, I, I smell the air, 
trying to detect any scents that smelled spidery and or There rapey. are maybe some webs around there, but... Oh, yeah. oh, wait a minute, Brian. Huh? What if one of us escaped and the other one walked through okay. claiming that they had murdered the other one? Uh, oh, that's not bad. Uh, okay, um, well, you got in first, so now for us to... For me to escape, you... You would have to go out and say, I killed him. I killed him and I ate him. Yeah. Okay. That's that's what I'm gonna do. I turn around and uh, and and I I start I start backing my my butt outward, uh, realizing it's so awkward. I wish I could turn around, but I can't because we're in this tight space. And I get all the way out and I get back in the arena and I and right, I wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute before before we split up. Splitting up has never really done as well in the past. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, I mean, I I I, I got to tell you, I uh, I don't see any way around it. Uh, I'll okay, tell you what. Okay, okay. Can we just get on the same page? You need to also escape, but escape with supplies. Sure, sure. Okay, look, don't worry. Uh, we're going to rendezvous. We're going to rendezvous, um, and uh, I'll get I'll get out. I'll join you on the outside. And okay, so, where are we going to we gonna meet up back on the ridge? <sighs> yeah, well. Uh, I don't hear any ugging. Uh, I'd say Ugg. Sh shout Ugg. I go, Ugg. I, I say, Ugg, Ugg, go. No, no, no. You're Ugging me right in the face. <laughs> oh, I'm losing consciousness. I mean, That's I've been. That's more like it. <laughs> I, I, I shout like, you've ever been Ugged with a stump before? Oh, no. oh, the Ugging. Crossing a line there. I'm uncomfortable with as a referee. Oh, jeez. This is like one of those. Those weird Paul Verhoeven movies, like the violence is just bringing up so many different emotions. I'm dying now. That's, that's, oh, my, I'm dead. That's, that's my slogan. All of the death and violence. I'm about to turn on the deadly gas. Uh, I, 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 no need. I, I run up to the door and I knock with the hand that still has a fist. And I say, I say, uh, oh, who oh boy. That was a tough one, but you I... You open up the door, and you step forward into another chamber. Yeah. All right, look around the chamber. What do I see? Ruff is standing there, hands on his hips. Did you do it? Did you do it? Oh, man. I hugged him so good. Uh, uh, he is... Uh, the, as you know, uh, human bodies from our dimension uh, vanish when we die. And if you look inside, you'll find no body, thereby proving I killed my enemy. He opens up the door and looks inside there and turns back to you and says... This is not Ugg. This oh. is just a joke, man. You murdered your friend. I was just kidding you. Uh, oh, this is just the locker room where we get ready to play Ugg. Uh, it's a oh. hazing thing. <laughs> well, maybe, I mean, you know, not not for me to blame you, but maybe if you'd explain the directions a little. <laughs> I mean, how, how seriously, this is a room filled with deadly gas, and there's just a vent on the wall protecting us from the jungle, and this is, this is you know, what you do is you uh, murder your friend? Hey, uh, well, as, as I'm sure you know, humans from our dimension also have the power of resurrection, but I'm going to need you to close, I'm going to, I'm going to close this door. Now, that's door. a complete lie. The UG is about to start. We got to go play UG. I'm no, sorry, oh, your no, friend. No, no, I, I, let me just go resurrect him. I can bring him back from the dead. No, I, I, no. I remember this all way, the... they grab you, they take you bodily, bodily, <laughs> mind you, into I, another I scream, room. I scream, Justin! Justin, it didn't work! You <laughs> you should be in this door! Go into another room, and you're in a locker room with a bunch of players, a bunch of dudes putting on, like, it's kind of like, looks like Mad Max sort of battle armor, oh, right? Man. With spikes and shoulder pads and stuff, and one of them turns like, hey, weren't there two of you? Uh, yeah, one... No, no, oh, you there was murder your friend, do you know? That's just a joke they play. No, 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 no. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> hey, uh, so the uniforms, the, are these like high I knock out my friend Phil, you know, to make him think that, like, you know, I'd killed him. And then I walk through there and, like, you're not even supposed to hit your friend. You're supposed to be, like, die valiantly together to make a great teammate, not, like, split apart. Uh, you know. Or murder somebody. Yeah, 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 but you know how. You... Somebody else at the other end of the locker room, his big tall guy, about seven foot tall, giant, big spiky helmet on his head says, you actually murdered the guy they sent you in here with? 
I, I, I mean, bro, you got the killer instinct. Yeah, act hard, Brian. Act hard. Act yeah. hard. I said, I said, I said, like I said, any other time when you've killed people immediately. I, I, well, I feel bad. I'm trying to turn over a new leaf, but you know what? I realize you guys are right, and I say, you're damn right. The worst part, I, he's suffocated on this stump, and I show him my stump as if it's a big, you know, like, ooh. And they immediately put a chainsaw on your stump. Oh, Put a double yeah. chainsaw, so it's totally not a ripoff of Army of Darkness, <laughs> Evil Dead. Oh, uh, that's good. So I hold it in the air, and I was just like, uh, well, who's ready to play some Ugg? Next thing you know, you're in battle armor. Oh, man, dude, I, uh, I, I check and see if Adolf can integrate with the battle armor and tell me anything about it. Sorry, Adolf is unavailable oh, right damn, now. Damn, Please damn, connect okay, to your fine. Wi-Fi networks. Uh, yeah, no, uh, 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 make a note to myself to invent the internet so that Adolf will work again. Uh, the uh, uh, man, I'm ready. I, I feel I feel suited up. I, I huddle feel up. Hold. They're huddling up time. It's huddle up time. All right, I get in and I say. Uh, uh, I say try- some words, Bri. Say some words, new team captain. Sure. Uh, oh. Friend killer. Your <laughs> new name is friend killer. <laughs> Uh, hey, listen up, man. Uh, we, uh, we've come a long way since we were small town kids, but we've hit the big time. And in this rousing speech, uh, I, we're all going to start cheering uh, death to anyone. Death. Just death. Everyone shout death because I'm sure death. Like, yes, death, death. Some of you are like, this guy is kind of intense. It's a little bit intense here, you know. Uh, and then I I, 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 I I crank on my uh, my chainsaw and no, I, well, I bro wait save that for outside it's not very good ventilation here oh, and the well, only shaft we have ventilation goes out to the deadly jungle which I would not want to go to and that's back in the other room okay and hey by the way the, real quick before, drum beats. before we go out like how deadly is the jungle I know you guys gotta say it's real deadly to keep society going but come on I mean like if a friend of mine was out there. He'd be, he'd be fine for a good... I mean, on a deadly scale or on a rapey deadly scale? <laughs> I mean, I mean, like, like if if he was out there without any weapons or backup, he'd be he'd be good for like a week or two. The right? Biggest men in the room are just looking at you like their faces are turned pale. Like, whoa! Good thing you killed him. It's better you killed him, friend killer. Better that you killed him, friend killer. Uh oh oh oh! You know what? Um, he had a a, a valuable. Ladies and gentlemen. Ugh is about to begin. Now you hear like some drum beats. Everybody's psyched up. There's a door in front of you. The door opens up and there's a long tunnel, like a long tunnel going through there. You're like, oh, it's time to go. Your masked win with your teammates and they start running down the corridor. They push you in. Friend killer, you first. <laughs> I said, yeah, who's got a friend that they don't like anymore? That's that's what I do. Like, uh, next, you see this like a big paper wall. You're supposed to break. It's like, yeah, use the chainsaw. Uh, yeah, wait, okay. So I crank up the chainsaw. I raise it up and I and I start slicing down the paper, screaming the whole way, putting on a big show. Crowds chanting, "Ugh, ugh, 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 ugh." And there's like, you know what? This village, like, this sounds like tens of thousands of people, not just the small group that you saw. Oh wow! So I, I just, I. Full on run out, charging and screaming, arms akimbo, as ready to spin around and 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 bask in the adulation of glory. And 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 I start, I try to start a chant, friend killer, friend killer. Friend you were about killer. to say that, but you run out into the field and you freeze. Oh, because right in front of you. Next time on Journey Quest, let's find out what happens to Justin in the dangerous rapey jungle. <laughs> See, I like I like the splitting up and the this the parallel uh, side quests because I'm not feeling so hot about my. I tried, I tried to just let you be the one. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, because that would have been great if if then we would have figured out that we both get to survive, but you're the one who who valiantly sacrificed yourself. <laughs> I love the fact. I love the fact. Cloth raped, then then have to deal with you and your <laughs> smug, like, oh yes. Well, anyway, truly, my selflessness is what brought us along. <laughs> I love the fact that our lives are on the line, and you're busy thinking about who has the moral high ground. <laughs> oh, stop it, please. Gentlemen, any picks? 
Yeah, man, I just wrapped up season three of Fargo, and hot googly dig dog was that great. Uh, I watched the first half of it week to week, and then I watched all day yesterday, just the last four or five episodes in a row. And it is uh, alternately, I, it, it's, it's, I think it might be my favorite season. It's the weirdest season for sure. And it's the one that breaks from convention of what Fargo's done the first two times. You know, the first time it did pretty much a version of the movie Fargo uh, with more depth and, and a lot of the architects tweaked a bit. Uh, the second time it was a familiar story, but set in the 1970s with, with a couple of really random wild cards. Uh, this one starts off so different and has uh, moments of, of, of whimsy in it. Uh, there's a brief moment that if you are as big of a fan of the Big Lebowski as I am, there was just this giddy 15 minutes in the middle of it. It's great. It's really, really good. And all of the performances are extraordinary. Uh, cool. I'm not done with it yet. I think I have a, a, probably about where you wound up binging from. And uh, I, I, I would say the first part of the season – uh, uh, I, I actually had the opposite reaction to. I, I kind of thought it was sort of telling that we were like getting kind of more of a formula. Like for the first time, for, uh, Fargo felt formulaic to me, um, but with different pieces. Uh, but man, as as the season's gone on, you've just kind of seen why that show is special in in that they're able to just take these kind of creative sort of. Uh, uh, left turns but you trust them to do it and not only are all the performances good and and as every fargo story eventually does it starts to take these left turns sometimes through bad luck sometimes through malice but also i just i, I loved uh you know that they have they have a one-off episode where it just kind of becomes an la detective story and yeah. they have a uh a, 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 a great to, to me that the episode that really made the season special was the uh, Peter and the Wolf episode uh, that I thought was just exceptionally well done. Uh, yeah. And I'll tell you what, best villain of the whole series to me. I loved Billy Bob Thornton. I thought he was good. But uh, but uh, 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 VM Varga is just so disgusting and uh, loved it. All right. Enough. No more. See it. I just want to be delighted and surprised when I watch it. Uh, so I'm yes. trying to know as little about it as possible. Okay. Um, sorry. You Bye. should know that it's called Fargo, and that yeah. that's about it. I, I like the, the two best seasons. Some of two of the best seasons of TV I've ever watched were season one and season two. So I've been trying to go through this, not even know. I know Ewan McGregor's in this. That's all I know. Oh, all I great. Know. Then you're going to have a great experience because yeah. it's there's lots to love about it. Uh, I have a pick, and uh, I mentioned last, I think it was last week, that we went to, or went to the, uh, they did an Adam West tribute in downtown Los Angeles where they projected the bad signal onto City Hall, which was um, amazing because I'm going to show you again the size of the crowd that was there. Um, I don't know if you can see that, but. Uh, yeah, oh my God, dude. yeah, that's a huge ass crowd. Thousands, thousands. I mean, there could have been. You know, I don't do a count. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people. This was a guy that finally didn't get his star on the Walk of Fame until like just a couple of years ago. But that's how people showed up, you know, to tribute, you know, the, the, the this man's life. There is a documentary out called uh, Starring Adam West, and it's about him. And it's sort of uh, you spend a lot of time with him. It was done about a couple of years right before he passed away. But he was still, I think it was, you know, late 70s, early 80s. I think it was early 80s when they did this. And it's really good. I mean, you just get a sense of him. And what a nice guy. What a really, really genuinely nice guy he comes across as. People around him. His family seems to adore him. And, and yes, we all know the stories about, you know, you know, when you wear that cape, you know, women, women seem to like that. And he probably went through some very difficult periods in his life. But it was just a, a very, very neat you know, uh, documentary to see this guy. And it just seemed like a very people around him who worked with him, whatever, just, just went on about what a, what just what a, a sweet, nice person he was. And just a great sense of humor. Very, very fast, very, very quick. So I highly recommend it. Uh, called starring Adam West. So right on made me want to be a nicer person. It didn't last, but it made me want to be a nicer person. <laughs> but officially there was a, there was a glimmer. Well, uh, just, my thing is going to be a, a Twitch channel 
Uh, for those of you who know that I'm a fan of uh, a professional wrestling, there was the first live streamed um, professional wrestling show from Austin, Texas this uh, Saturday. It's a promotion called Wrestle Circus, but I really, really, really am bullish on what the platform can do for that very unique kind of art form, which is, uh, I think, primarily meant to be experienced live, but in our modern era of live streaming and, and how cheap switching technology is and how cheap uh, the camera technology is, you can do a very, very, very credible and engaging live stream. And uh, they have gone whole hog into uh, making this their new business platform. And, and uh, Twitch worked with them over the weekend and, and uh, gave them a lot of pointers. But, you know, from, from what I've heard from uh, uh, people in and around Twitch, this was something that they were huge, huge, huge uh, uh, fans of. And so they sold out the show with 700 plus down there in downtown Austin. And uh, they did about 7,000, uh, upwards of 7,000 concurrent live viewers. And I think it's just a great way to just get more people and ultimately more money into a an industry that uh, you know, is for the performers, very, very, very high risk and uh, a, a, a slim reward uh, oftentimes, uh, all too often. There's just not a lot of money in indie wrestling. And this, I hope, brings another way that much in the same way that, you know, so much of, uh, of this show right now is making their money directly from the fans that Twitch continues to give new platforms for indie wrestlers and those who want to support them. So I would say... Go ahead and check out uh, the show that Wrestle Circus put on. You got to be a subscriber on Twitch to watch the uh, the video on demand, but they're running it constantly on their channel, so you can catch at least parts of it for free. Uh, you know when they're rerunning it, and uh, they are doing live shows throughout. I think it's like once every two weeks they're doing a live show. So uh, I would I would say support them. I think it's hopefully more people, more promotions uh, decide to come on. Uh, come on board with that because I think it is kind of game changing for that level of the wrestling industry. I love the idea that, you know, we've talked about all the way back in the early 90s. Uh, uh, Michael Robinson of MP's, MP3.com projected the the rise of the middle class rock star. And now we're all the way to the point where, you know, the rise of the middle class pro wrestler and the rise of the middle class. You know, I love that we could get so niche on so much stuff. Well, well and let me let me just explain kind of the economics of, of independent wrestling. Uh, these guys get paid small amounts of money, even the big names, the names that that get people in to come see the show. We are talking in the the sub 500 category of what they are getting paid to do that show. They also get their travel paid for, but this is not a lot of cash. They primarily rely on selling their merchandise. The idea that now you can have thousands of people watching that are right in front of their, uh, uh, their computers and people can offer discount codes on their merch to people that are sitting in front of their computers uh, or directly say, which was what Wrestle Circus did, that if you want to just donate money to somebody because you love that match, you can do that, and 100% of that money goes to the performers. You can you now opened up a whole new revenue stream for independent uh, wrestlers that did not fundamentally exist on any level of the business prior, which I think is game-changing. That's amazing. Yeah, there was uh, one of the, a uh, couple of the wrestlers, but one of the wrestlers who was in Glow, uh, as, uh, when they w go to see a guy's wrestling, I forget his name escapes me, but he's a big indie. He's a guy that you know can pull down six figures a year just doing the wrestling circuit. Joey Ryan. Um, Joey Ryan. Yeah, Joey Ryan. Uh, yeah, you know. Um, play, is Mr. Monopoly, I believe, in Glow. Yeah. Um, uh, the one more thing I was going to say about the Adam West thing, the, the, the part two is just Watch that for the period of after what happens after your Batman. And he talks about the very, very low point in his life where here he's famous as Batman, but he can't get work anywhere else. And the, the, the challenge of that now, it's a little bit different today. Like, you know, at that point, there weren't a lot of cons. There weren't a lot of ways to go sign autographs, do that kind of stuff. And it was much more challenging. Fan culture wasn't as organized. And, you know, it's it's depressing because here's a guy who everybody knew talking about having to borrow money, you know, to put buy groceries for the family. And you know, you're like, wow, you know, as famous as he was, what he went through in that period. And it's just it's, it's changed. But, you know, it, but it's still interesting because like I've, you know, met, you know, people who, you know, I met people at parties that you immediately would recognize. Oh, I know this person from this show or whatever. 
they're trying to figure out their next thing. They're trying to figure out their next gig. And they've got this huge name recognition and touching on what's going on at Twitch and a lot of other stuff. We are in this point where it's becoming easier now to sort of translate that recognition into something wet, something else. Uh, in fact, so. maybe maybe we can segue into that for after things, because I, I would love to talk and explore more like how the Internet has has made it possible to monetize in, in clever, more subtle and more appropriate ways. Uh, when Because it used to be that you had fame and the only way to translate it into money was to have a very few gatekeepers, a.k.a. producers, point to you and say, you're going to get all the money, kid. And then and if you if you they didn't get that, then then you didn't get to, to do anything about it. Yep. So, gentlemen. It's been weird. Hell yeah. OK, quick yeah. break. Sure. Yeah, let me uh, make sure the kids are all good. Everybody. So we got a uh, quick killer coming up a little later today with uh, Snubs, Shannon Morse, and then um, uh, and then of course Night Attack tomorrow, and then Nerdtaculars this weekend, this week slash weekend. Um, so we're gonna do a live Night Attack there. I don't know what the streaming situation is going to be. Um, if, if there's something going on, then we'll be on it. And if not, then, um, but then we will broadcast that episode out on Tuesday. And, um, uh, and in fact, so we're going to have, um, the Bizarre Briefing next Tuesday. Um, we were going to do it tomorrow, but, um, I need to get caught up on stuff because we're leaving for Nertacular a little early. Um. Uh, but so after we do the bizarre briefing, oh, hold on, he's locked. Give me one sec. Whoops, sorry about that. Um, but so, uh, JC Calhoun says this morning Scott said everything would be streamed. Okay, cool. Well, then catch that on the Frog Pants channel. Um, uh, what was I going to say? And then. Uh, so next Tuesday we'll have the bizarre briefing before we would normally do night attack and then I guess we will rebroadcast the night attack um, uh, episode on Tuesday at a normal time and then maybe we'll do a not attack um, afterwards to uh, g give you guys something on a Tuesday night. Um, but yeah, it'll be fun. Come see us for Nertacular. We're going. We're getting in like a day or so early. Um, and, uh, yeah, frogpants.tv is what Dan Wally is saying for the streaming. Cool. Cool, 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 cool beans. Uh, Dan Wally says, no night attack tomorrow. No, Dan Wally, listen to me. We're going to have a night attack tomorrow, and then we'll have a night attack over the weekend at Nertacular, and then there will be a rebroadcast next to next week. Hashtag Wingazi. Oh, how are you guys doing? It's Monday. It's Monday afternoon. And yeah. Doing the do. Um, what else? What else is going on? Um, just coming down. Uh, uh, Codes from Home says, did the last Bizarre Briefing ever go up? No, it didn't. It's going to go up this week. Uh, that's why we pushed the Bizarre Briefing briefing to next week. Because uh, you didn't want to record another one before? Before we put <laughs> out the other one. one? Yeah, <laughs> a little bit. Um, and that'll be funny going up since we, I don't even think we acknowledged the, t the TV pilot. Or like we outright said it because it hadn't been announced. Oh, that's we funny. Day and stuff. Yeah. It's like we talk around it a little bit, but um, yeah. Hopefully that will go up either tonight or tomorrow. 
uh, so we can do a live episode tomorrow, and I'll put a little thing at the front saying, hey, sorry, super duper late. Uh-oh. Is this a new phenomenon, animated uh, tweet emojis? or have... These are bits. Oh, those are, got it. Those got are it. bits, yeah. yeah okay. They keep adding new ones. Uh, oh, we can't send bits on our own channel. Uh, that's cool. I didn't know about that um, Rust the Circus. I'm actually going to... Oh, that's where I'm logged on. Yeah, exactly. I'll check that out later. Oh, how you doing, Brian? Uh, good, 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 good. Yeah. I uh, good weekend. Uh, yeah, good. yeah. I uh, I hit rank three on Hearthstone. Nice. What happens when you hit one? Uh, you you become legend, and at that point, you get ranked in the top one thousand of all players. Uh, oh, wow. Uh, yeah. Uh, Ice Cube says, uh, "Do we we could we could have a custom bits cheer, but we just haven't made we just haven't had time to make one yet." Um, I think we still have a couple more emote, emote slots that we can fill out too. Yeah, I don't know if y'all noticed uh, Bryce was a little busy putting a television show <laughs> on the air. Like, <laughs> like uh, I think we have all been around television productions that usually have more than a Bryce to put it on the air. <laughs> So uh, yeah, he's been busy. Yeah, give him some, give him some breathing room. I mean, it takes two to make a television show. It takes Bryce to make it, and Brian to say, "So how's it coming? How's how's it, is it coming along? Good? Okay, yeah. good." <laughs> okay. Um, oh, by the way, uh, nightattack.tv/discord. Justin put up a bunch of action news materials that he shot. If you want to get in on the Our whole shoot day that we did for pictures and gifts, green screen stuff, uh, on the street stuff, uh, it, it is there for your nefarious uh, purposes. So go ahead and check it out. It's up there. The whole goddamn folder uh, is 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 up there for you. So uh, go ahead and check it out. <laughs> <laughs> so we got this one, which is uh, snug action, and then this is your reaction nude. So just everybody, just if you're if you're underage, just block your eyes. Oh my god! Oh, Jesus. Okay. <laughs> all right, oh, all right, all cool. right. Great, GG, guys. Thanks. <laughs> so some of them warning. I'm gonna retweet, and others I won't. <laughs> but. You know. I appreciate everybody who spends any time uh, uh, certainly working on it. Um, but yeah, in the Discord, in the fan-made channel, Jerry put the whole link. That you, can, you can find it in the pins. Uh, you'll f there are already some photoshops in there now. So, Have you, uh, have you announced... Uh, man, uh, uh, I, don't know, I don't know how much is public about the Action News release schedule and the intended marketing blitz that you... Uh, uh, the, I don't want to say anything out of order. Well, he's had yep. the date, the, the launch date. So the yeah. launch date June is 30th. on there. This, and I, this Friday, June thirtieth, Action but, News launch on Kickstarter. And yeah. then the, uh, but the uh, the podcast is out now. Podcast is, uh, I don't know if it's on iTunes yet. That's up to Cheeto. But uh, uh, I think it is. Uh, everything is uploaded to my SoundCloud, so that'll be pumping. Uh, that is our audio diary of where we. Attempt to not lose sixty thousand dollars on uh, a Kickstarter again. Uh, we're, we're going step by step throughout uh, the process to check where we went right or wrong. Uh, so if you enjoyed our medium posts about uh, you know where where we went wrong and how we turned the ship around, then you'll enjoy this uh, podcast with John and I. Uh, and then if you like the Medium articles, guess what? There's another Medium article coming called <laughs> The Ten Kickstarter Commandments, which also ties into the podcast where we kind of just go through our hard and fast rules on mapping out your project and, and doing all those little nitty gritty things that we either did or didn't do that led to us making $140,000 on Kickstarter and then ultimately losing $60,000. So yeah, uh, uh, you can look for if at first you don't succeed, right? Is that what it's going to be called on, on iTunes? Uh, yeah, if at first you don't succeed is going to be the podcast on iTunes. And then uh, uh, Open Bayou, 
uh, says, Justin, uh, do you want us to wait until a certain time to go to Kickstarter or just buy it when it's published? Kickstart it on Friday. Kickstart it on Friday. Kickstart it on Friday. Yeah. Our entire, uh, 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 the way that we earn Kickstarters trust and faith and therefore get their marketing arm behind us is if we pop that number as fast as possible and then they get behind us with their marketing arm. That's ultimately what kind of made us soar the last time and we hope that that is the case this time. So, uh, yeah, this Friday, this Friday, this Friday, this Friday, this Friday. Action news. Action news. Cool, yeah. Uh, you guys want to do some after things? Yep. Yep. You good to go, yep. Andrew? All right, then take it away in three, two. Welcome to After Things, where we talk about things after weird things. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Justin Robert Young. Yo, what up? Brian Brushwood. Yo. So, gentlemen, um, well, this is from uh, uh, Ken Palishok, who has uh, been a regular forever and a fan of the show, or friend of the show, maybe he's a fan, I don't know. And he has a question about podcasting and going to a Patreon model. Listening to the last episode of After Things really got me thinking about implementing Patreon. I'm a little hesitant because I don't want to turn off fans. Personally, whenever a podcast I enjoy starts pushing Patreon, I feel a tinge of guilt because I can't just support every podcast I listen to. I have a very long commute. I'd happily listen to ads so I wouldn't feel like such a leech. On certain shows, I felt like the non-supporting listener is treated as a sort of second-class fan. Perhaps I'm weird for thinking this way, but I want all my listeners to feel valued. Mr. Rogers is big here of mine, and I'm a little worried about what Patreon might do to that atmosphere. Did any of you have similar anxieties before pushing your Patreon accounts? Brian, I couldn't help but notice you've been doing Modern Rogue for a while now, and you're just starting a Patreon. Is that more difficult than just starting the Patreon at the beginning? What made you decide to go that route? Justin, you've got a single Patreon for all of your solo endeavors. Would you recommend that for a solo podcaster? Ken. Uh, hey, Brian, you want to reenact the first time you brought up Patreon to me? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> uh, hey, Justin, so there's this thing. It's it's called uh, Patreon. I think we're going to do it for Cord Killers, uh, you know, because we're starting off. We're, we're not with the network anymore. You know, we weren't making a lot of money with an ad-supported network. You know, we were just paid salary. I got, I got like 100 bucks an episode. But I'm just saying, like, maybe we can make more on Cord Killers. Maybe we could do the same thing for Night Attack, the successor to uh, successor of NSFW. Uh, actually, this was pre that. Oh, really? You brought it up to me while NSFW show was still going on before there was any hint of of any problems when everything was still rolling. You you brought it up to me then, and I said, "No, it's gonna ruin the atmosphere." We have a small but dedicated audience, and as soon as you introduce money to it, it's gonna it's gonna make everybody. Uh, uh, at at worst, feel bad, uh, or sorry, at, at best, feel bad about themselves if they can't contribute or they're not contributing as much. Or at worst, people are going to get really, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, demanding on the content. And so much of our show is based on our relationship with the audience. We can't ruin it. And exactly how much money are we going to get out of it anyway? It's a bad idea, Brian. It's never going to work. Uh, uh, hard and fast, no, infinity and forever. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, and then what was the, what was the, the, the turning point for you? We left the network and <laughs> we, we were like, uh, uh, the conversation that, well, you and Tom did it initially and, uh, it did very well with cord killers and Tom did really well with, uh, daily tech news show, which is I'm sure, uh, uh, which brought us to another common thought. Ah, uh, well. We missed the boat. Yes. Uh, uh, you know, uh, everybody's got a Patreon now, so uh, no room at the inn for us. Uh, we uh, looks like, you know, Tom's got one. You and Tom have one. Uh, uh, Scott's got one. Yep. Nope. It, uh, and, uh, and uh, money's all gone. <laughs> of course, we thought the same thing about Kickstarter, right? We thought we thought like, uh, oh, Kickstarter came and went. It's it's uh, now everyone's gonna figure out that the Kickstarter projects. Uh, are just a money hole that never delivers anything. Uh, you know, I was thinking about starting a podcast, but geez, I mean, everyone's got a podcast now. I mean, Kevin Smith just started one. You know, like, <laughs> uh, Dude, pro uh, tip. Uh, 
if you think it's over, but everybody's talking about how big it is, it's starting. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and so ultimately, I mean, listen, it, it was a big thing for, for Brian and I to, to do the Patreon. And, and at the point that we actually did it, the roles had kind of reversed. And I was I was very into the idea of Patreon. And Brian was actually uh, a little bit more hesitant because you just had launched Cord Killers. And and the 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 one final thing was was us kind of simultaneously coming to the realization that like, I mean, what's the worst that can happen? We make less than the two hundred and fifty dollars a week that we were splitting uh, uh, from from Twit. Like, yeah. uh, other than that, we even if it's a buck more, we get a raise, right? Uh, yeah, no, the budget, uh, the the bar was fairly low for uh, for us to declare victory on it, and of course, it ended up being. Not only just a good thing, but a li but a life changing thing for both of us. All of a sudden, you know, um, the the necessity for us to invest all our time in day jobs really really transformed. Uh, but in both of those instances, those were cases where uh, I, I I know Ken is acting as though um, uh, you know we launched with those Patreons, but we really didn't. Uh, we had I, I always think in terms of things as as you plant. You sow and then you reap. Um, in, uh, back to the college days when I was touring, I sowed by sending thousands and thousands of postcards to, to colleges nationwide and booking entire tours. And then I reaped when, when I got to do that. Likewise, we, show, we sowed goodwill uh, and demonstration of brand value that we we're able to show up week after week and do these podcasts for what, how, how many years in, uh, were we at Twit? Five years, I guess. And then, uh, and then we got to, to to reap and find out. Well, I wonder how much how much cash there is there, how much goodwill is there, and and so we we discovered it that way. Whereas um, you, Justin, with with the jury uh, Patreon feed, that was something that you started uh, concurrently with doing more podcasting, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, I'd done the jury show for a little bit, uh, but. That was me putting my toe in the water, thinking about quitting my job. Can I? Uh, I just wanted. I sorry, no, I want to get back to his fir Ken's first question was just the idea of doing it alone, and is because his talks about like he feels like is he depriving his fans because he feels bad that he can't support some of these things. Yeah, and uh, and 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 I would say that one, if you're not going to do this thing because there's not going to be a way to support it then it don't feel bad to do it because if it's the difference between this existing and not existing is people supporting it, then that's why it is. Some podcasts make you feel bad because you're not supporting it. We may joke at it, but we love all our listeners. Anybody who listens to us, we're happy to have. We're very, very happy to have. Now, we'll create special content or whatever to incentivize people, but we, you know, we've had these conversations. I had a conversation with Justin about a podcast project he's working on about at what point is it okay with the people who he supports, who supports him to then make that content available to everybody else because you want to make it available to everybody. I love digital publishing because I can give my books away whenever I want, you know, and so I don't have to have this, no, you got to buy the book. If you can't afford it, I don't want to deprive you of this experience. So anyhow. Yeah, you know, I, I think ultimately don't be afraid to introduce to the, I introduce to your audience the idea that some of them can give you money. And, and one of the guiding principles that I live my life by is a, a quotation that I will read from St. Colleen, who told me wisely, give everybody who wants to give you money every avenue to do it and understand that it can be varied, right? And some people like to give you money for, for the Patreon and they like to have it shouted out every week. Uh, I understand that there's other people that, you know, uh, uh, want to support in other ways or, or can't support at all. And that's fine. You know, I, I just want to give people the options to do it. Now, I, I do think that there is something, and I'd love to hear both of you guys uh, uh, chime in on this. The idea that now that we live in a world where Patreon is such a thing that maybe there is room for a, a post, this is a thing conversation of, yeah, you want to know what? Let's, let's make sure that we anchor in, free listeners rule, but also as opposed to here are the people that are making this happen. Thank you, exalted patrons. You know, is, is there an evolution of that message going forward? Man, um, that's, that's a really good question that I'm wrestling with, uh, you know, as we, as we gear up for, uh, for some kind of modern road release. And, and I, 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 I wish I could, um, 
I wish I had an answer that was simple, but I really don't. It's, I, I'm going to say that uh, there are many different ways. We've seen a bunch of wildly different methods to reach out and solicit uh, memberships. Uh, and we've seen the, the many of them, virtually every way you could think of, we've seen some version of success that comes with that, uh, whether it's per thing released, you know, is this, you know, value for value. You're not getting any, uh, you're not getting anything special. You're just paying what you, what you deep in your heart know this is worth. Uh, others are like, you get all the bells and whistles. You're on the inside, you know, and we, you know, even Twitch, uh, does a version of that where it's like, you know, do it for the emotes. Uh, and I guess also along the way you'll support the show. I, I wish I, I wish I had um, a simple answer, but I really don't. I think, yeah, you different things, different different models. So weird things, this started off just the thing we did for fun. And, you know, we figured out, no, we'll, well, we make money from it later on. And we, we did it years before we actually said, oh, let's do a Patreon to support the thing. I, I have Magic Club, which is still in its very, very early stages. And that's one where we have the free component, which is Magic Club, which airs on YouTube. And then we have the Secret Session, which is only available through Patreon because it solved two problems. One was if we wanted to bring on really talented magicians to show us some really cool stuff. They don't want it out on public YouTube. They don't want that out in front of everybody, but they would like, yeah, people who have an interest in learning it. So we needed a wall and a cheap paywall seemed like a very effective way to do that. Um, and so that for that show, that's the model. Half the content, the real content's the secret session, but you only get that through the Patreon. And uh, I mean, are there people that would love to have access to that they can't afford it? Absolutely. Is there a solution to that? Maybe at some point, you know, we can figure that out. But just the difference between this existing or not existing comes to a paywall and creating that and, and doing that. So, you know, it depends on what you're trying to do. So to the bigger question, because I, I would say uh, to the bigger question about timing. Um, well, I, I, I don't know. Um, I, I think there are. You could frame it however you want. You could say, hey, if you would like to give me money, you can now on Patreon. Uh, and then uh, how much you want to make it all bells and whistles and here's a fancy wonderland that you'll get an enhanced or superior experience or greater access to me or, or whatever those things are. Uh, again, that's that's you got to read your audience to get a feel for, for what that is. Um, I'll tell you this much. A big part of the, the Modern Rogue Patreon is going to be that it's clear that there's an actual fan base and and I'll uh, you know I want very much for Modern Rogue to kind of follow in the footsteps of of the greats like Rooster Teeth or whatever there's there's an amorphous fan base that probably will never hear about the Diamond Club group uh that uh, uh, that that doesn't know about Chat Realm but they want to be their own thing they all are rallying around uh the Modern Rogue and so part of that is to create a clubhouse and I know that Patreon wants to be the social media platform for people to talk to uh, to the people that they love. They want that to be the one clubhouse where everyone hangs out in. The clubhouse of rogues. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I'm going to say, as far as the question he had asked about, you know, should you start with, do you start the patron or you wait and add it in later on? I think it's different. It's a different model in Kickstarter where you're asking people to put faith in what you're doing and say, trust me on this. I like Patreon because, like, for Magic Club, we do it per episode. We don't do monthly. We do per episode because sometimes it might be a week or two, two weeks before the episodes go up. And it just seemed like that's a better way than saying, yeah, give us money every week, and I promise you, you'll get it. This way you only get charged when you know the show goes through. Um, and it depends upon your way to do it. I'm, I was happy to launch with a Patreon model because let's build that in the get-go so we know we know our metric. We have a metric. How many people are supporting us? What are they liking? What do we build from there? It wasn't like, eh, we're going to launch this Patreon and we're going to make money. You know, I explained it to Jordan. I'm like, we got to look at this evolution of this over a year. You know, we got to look at our growth over a year and see where we go, not over the next six weeks or three months because we're still going to be figuring things out. But having that from the starting point as our business model made sense with that show rather than, oh, let's do it for four months or five months and then say, hey, let's do a Patreon because, you know, maybe we'd find out like, oh, there's zero support for it, you know, and, and now we need to adjust versus here, you know, every time episodes go up, we get new subscribers and we go, OK, we know this is working. And for as l tiny little footprint as we have, it's been very effective for getting view. The ratio of views for people who want to support it has been very high. So, so you are you are a great example, because initially I had always said post Patreon, start your Patreon at the beginning. 
if you have a new podcast, start your Patreon, and then you decide how much you plug it, right? But you you do want to have, if somebody falls in love with you, an ability for them to feel good by supporting you. But I think I've evolved that a little bit. And part of what I think it is 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 what Andrew has said, that, you know, you launch Magic Club because you had your value proposition already baked into it. Mm -hmm. Uh, People who are involved in magic understand the concept of pay the money. Here's the secret. That's the way that magic works. That's Mm -hmm. magic business that talks that does tutorials or anything like anytime that you are getting the full work through, you can almost universally expect to pay. Uh, And it's the reason why Brian has such a meticulous wall with scam school and stuff like that is that you need stuff that's already been out there. Uh, to to go to run through it, and that's the free tier, effectively. Uh, if you have a new podcast, I would say uh, it's. I would still say start it, just so you have it. Somebody finds it, you know, it's part of your Twitter or something like that. If somebody really wants to give you money, don't like say no. Screw you. I won't take your money. But if if you want to hold off on that hard push before you have the value element to it, then I, I think that that might be a good idea. Yeah, I think it's it's figuring out like what's that wh- going to say, hey, we launched a thing, you can support us. I mean, there's not a, I don't think there's a, you're not, it, I wouldn't do that if you're charging monthly and you may be doing infrequent episodes because if you'd go a month or you only know, put up one episode and they pay the same as what they were expecting something weekly, you're going to anger people and you're going to turn people off before you want to. We went oh. with a per. What's that? I a hundred percent. I mean, yeah. I, I also just disagree with monthly stuff for podcasts, like in in general. I think for like Modern Rogue, it would make sense. I don't know what you guys are are, are doing for that, but like, uh, if if you guys are looking to do multiple things a week or something like that, then then maybe. But I've, I've well, only- yeah, that's that's the only hiccup. And and to be honest, I'm not. Uh, where where we ended up was doing a, a monthly thing, but but I'm I'm back to reconsidering it because I'm I have no spine. Uh, but because I wonder if it could be phrased as per Friday release, where it's like, look, you are paying for the Friday episode. Everything else is just free extra stuff that's made possible thanks to our generous patrons. And then and then maybe that would be. But but one of the weird that's, aspects that's, of that's what I'm doing with jury. I mean, uh, uh, you only pay for jury like on on the jury Patreon. So you pay for my one mic podcast that comes out on Tuesdays. Uh, politics is free. And then if you want to be at, at the three dollar level, which is for political super fans, you get two other bonus shows that I do that are audio only uh, 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 for, for the week. But I, I do it weekly and it's centered around the idea that a show comes out and that's what you pay for. I'm going it, to it's interesting. I ran into somebody at the Magic Castle last night uh, who uh, had just re- just a couple days before it supported me on supported the Magic Club podcast because he's a Magic fan and he's a fan of weird things. And it was interesting. He says, yes, I haven't started listening to pot. You know, I didn't I haven't started listening to Magic Club yet, but I saw you're doing this. So I figured I'd go in and support it. You get a lot of people out there like I'm like, well, man, like I can't wait for you to actually dig into it because I think it's it's actually really kind of cool. But I'm going to make a point to an argument for launching with a Patreon. You ready? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and doing episode only so that way if it atrophies and dies on the vine, nobody's getting charged. When people go back and discover you from older episodes. Oh, yeah. And then they, they then they realize every single week, like, oh wait, yeah, I can. Uh, to be honest, that's that's a big part of um, you know the the retail side of things uh, with scam stuff. Uh, you know, the longer that tail gets, the more episodes where you know there's there's clever stuff that we're showing off that happens to be available at scam stuff. You know, the more uh, people discover that back catalog and eventually make it to the website. So our next, our next I'm going to move on to another question. This is from James Harrison, our favorite Canadian pickpocket. Hey guys, as a sex as a success story, being a full time magician that can feed his family and have a roof over my head. Hey, brag about it, why don't you? Ha. From the after things <laughs> think take, I've been keeping my nose to the grindstone, getting gigs, planting seeds, and taking names. But as I look out on my mass empire, I notice something lacking. I'm having trouble making time for my friends' family hobbies. You guys have failed to mention how to make me time, not just that time to make a deadline or set up a new project, but to have fun. How do you step away to help your brain refresh without feeling guilty? I notice Brian and Justin playing Hearthstone all the time. Thanks for friending, by the way. How do they do it and not feel like they have to get back to work? 
how do you make the t- take the time to recharge? Sorry. Uh, number one, busted. Uh, <laughs> I've been playing a lot of Hearthstone. Uh, uh, but I would say almost without question, anytime you see me playing Hearthstone, it's because I'm also doing something else that's already on the schedule. For example... Uh, uh, and, and the answer is, uh, uh, you put it on the calendar, whatever it is you need to do. If you are feeling like your connection with your eldest daughter is low, then, then you put it on the calendar that this time I'm going to go make time to do whatever with my kid. Um, the times I play Hearthstone are either when I'm watching a, a television show for, uh, cord killers and it's something, and, and as a result, like I'll, I'll keep having to press pause on it um, as I get distracted. But the bulk of, of my goofing around is, is during workouts. I'll do two, two, one or two hour long exercise bicycle times, and that's when, to help pass the time, I'll listen to an audiobook and play Hearthstone. Or when you're on an airplane, or when you're at the airport, or whatever. This is all uh, dormant bandwidth that's not being used for anything else, and probably could not be used for uh, this is all just me making excuses for hearthstone um but i as far as like to to have leisure time recognize you only have three energy bars instead of uh uh health mana and uh and stamina you've got uh uh, uh, uh physical health uh emotional connections with other people and money and so if you recognize that you do not have the emotional connection that you want with someone or that you are are feeling like your mental health is deteriorating then what you got to do is you got to rebalance those those bars because you can't work yourself like crazy uh although you you can you just burn out of steam a lot faster um man yeah i i i don't know i, I don't i don't think i have uh a I've always had a problem with the idea of a work-life balance, um, and 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 I have the ability to kind of, uh, you know, kind of navigate this in a different way than Brian does, uh, but not as freely as Andrew does. As you know, I'm in between. I I have a wife, but not kids, right? So there is an element of me that needs to tend to somebody else, but uh, also I spend the majority of my day alone uh, or talking to you fine folks. Uh, so I, I think that part of it for me is understanding what brings me money. Am I focusing on that? Am I getting that done? Am I a good teammate to those that I am on the same team with? And am I continuing to kind of turn that crank? And if I am doing that, then I will allow myself to play Hearthstone when I eat lunch, you know? Uh, if, if I'm not doing that and I'm not at peace with that, then that often, you know, forces me to, to kind of do more stuff. But, uh, I, I think, you know, I've, I've never really found when other people talk about a work-life balance, I've, I've never really found a lot of common ground with that because in general, I, I want my work to be as pleasurable or as rewarding as possible. And that's not usually the conversation that I wind up having with other people. Um, so I, I, I quite, I, I don't know exactly what the best way to unplug is cause I don't really like to unplug, but, uh, well, I also like to play Hearthstone when I eat. I'll, I'll tell you what, um, you know, for, for me, it's, it's all about, you know, live, live by a calendar, have your obligations out there, have what you know you need to do. Um, and it used to be when I was on tour, the easiest times were, were, uh, for downtime were, you know, places where it was just impossible for me to get anything else done, you know, traveling at the airport, uh, in the hotel right before a gig or right after a gig, like those are protected spaces. Like when my, my, my one job is to get rested and get pumped up for this gig and then do the best version of the gig that I can. Um, absent that, as I spend more time at home, uh, it's become more important for me to schedule out responsibilities. So it's like, instead of leaving a to-do just kind of vaguely uh, amorphous, oftentimes I'll, I'll put it on the calendar and say, okay, at three o'clock, I'm going to knock this thing out. And then when three o'clock comes, it's time to knock it out, or it's time to intentionally punt it to another time. But in either case, you don't have that heavy weight just sitting on you. Um, for example, the frustrating times it's it's almost better now that we're so busy that or that I, I don't know all of us are so busy because um 
you don't have that weight of waking up and knowing that what you ought to do is hop on the phone and make miserable phone calls to try to book gigs. Uh, and instead, uh, you know, you have everything sketched out. Now, what you can do is just, you know, limit it, say, I'm going to do one hour of cold calling and however many things I book, that'll be that. And then I'll be done. And then, I'll, then it'll be one hour of Hearthstone is my reward. Like that changes things so that you get through the part you don't like and you try to make the most out of it because you see that deadline. You see that that end zone coming up and then at the end of it, you get the reward. So. I don't know. I'd say just, you know, call them what they are. These are these are rewards for yourself. Put them on the calendar. Always put them at the end of some amount of pain. For me, it's working out mostly because that's something that I've, uh, you know, I don't like going and doing group workout activities uh, because I get bored. Whereas, you know, having that to distract me is a reward that keeps me doing the hard stuff. I have nothing of value to contribute to this discussion because <laughs> I I would say that I utterly fail at the work life balance. I would say my life is a product of that failure. So uh, yeah, it's, it, for what it's worth, it seems to be working out pretty well <laughs> between your prodigious output of novels and television and hosting duties and and lectures and, and, and I still mean, single, no kids, <laughs> uh, and 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 those are things. At some point, I would you know married, have kids. That's option things I'd like to, but I know that my you know my one of the things that's always been a frustrating thing in relationships is my proclivity towards. I'm going to go dive into this thing and I'm just going to do this sort of thing. And that's certainly making time for others. But I think that relates too. is that, you know, I, I, I was up till 5 AM cause I have a project and I'm like, I'm not going to go to bed until I solve this thing. I'm not going to go to bed until I solve this thing. Hypothetically, uh, you know, uh, I'm not to say this is me, but I could be the kind of person that could be like, ah, let me, uh, let me take the iPad out and, and look at some adult material. Right. In the middle of that, be like, meanwhile, there's this coding thing I'm trying to solve. Let me pull this other window open. Ha! Ha! <laughs> then, you, uh, then you get your copy-paste mixed up, and you get some very strange code. Yeah, so. I will say that everything I learned about, like, productivity and work ethic, I learned from Andrew. I'm like apologize there, for that. I'm very sorry about that. There's, uh, there's, there's nobody that I, I have, I have taken more of a cue in my life than to say I, I want to be in other people's eyes as productive as what I saw out of, out of Andrew. Now, at the same time, I know that that's impossible for me <laughs> i i can't i can't do that andrew is one of the most prolific uh, uh productive people on the planet and yet uh and i think we've talked about this on on this show i think that you have been more productive or at least there has been less of the projects that ran super super hot and then uh, uh you know didn't pay off in the way that you would have liked as you have taken more of a step back to understand that like you should be around people more. <laughs> and that was very much coincided to your trip to, to your moving to LA where I think you just had a more conducive lifestyle to, to how you wanted to live. Yeah. I, I certainly, I would say I'm at, you know, probably the most productive period of my life and I'm also more social than I've ever been. And I would say that, you know, and for me that's, like, yeah, I hung out with people Friday night. <laughs> you know, that that's that's my my metric. I had, I mean, I had a I had a I made being in L.A. made it a lot easier for me to have a social life because more of the people I knew and I wanted to hang out with were here or happened through here. You know, I had amazing an amazing week last night. Not going to brag. I got to go hiking with Paul Zach and Matt Ridley. You know, oh, my gosh, I bet that was amazing. Yeah, because it's so it's like because it's like, oh, you know, Matt had to be in town. Paul was there and we're all friends. And so it was one of these kind of cool things. I'm like. I would not would not have happened in South Florida would not have happened in South Florida. And then Friday and then I go dive back into my work. I go home. I go dive back into my work. And then Friday night I pop up because I got to go to this amazing party where it was like, you know, an L.A. party where it's this big, huge four story mansion overlooking the hills kind of thing. And you're meeting people who are famous and cool and whatever. 
And I'm like, yeah, this wouldn't happen in South Florida. This wouldn't happen here. And then I just go back into my little hole and go do my little work. And I'm like, okay, I socialized this week. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I went out twice, you know, and, and now I'm going to go back and work. And so for me, uh, it doesn't have to be the volume of time. It just means the quality of time. And, and I will, I will make an effort. I'll say like, I will, like people talk about Wonder Woman. I'm like, I want to see a Wonder Woman. Like I need to see it in the theater. I'll go see it Sunday afternoon. I know I want to finish this thing. I know I want to get this other thing done. And I get so much joy out of the things I do that other people look at as work. That's the thing. But I'm like, I will go do this and I will stop the working for a little while to go do something like that. You know, um, uh, somebody mentioned the 3D printing thing. A funny thing that actually led to something which I'm not at liberty to disclose. But, oh, that's great. Uh, yes. Um, and also, by the way, if we want to start listing the the businesses that that Andrew has has started, man, we got we got a long list, brother. <laughs> and it, and it's you know, and the and the danger is when they when they when they go nowhere and they don't accomplish anything, and then you pick up and you start over on something else, and and that's been a pattern I've tried very much to to step to not have happen. And and I know I've had a I've had a thing just recently with my project Tiny Shop where. I'm like, I need to learn how to make an iPhone app, and I dove deep into that, and then along the way, I had a really cool idea for an app. I want to do this, but you know, tiny shop like author page, there are things that I keep open in the background, and I do a little bit of here, a little bit of there. there. Those are in phases where it's like, you know, they're still there, they're still there. There are other things you just sort of go, man, that's not going to happen, and it's not easy. It's not easy because sometimes you got to say, this is the extent of it, or sometimes you got to say, am I just chasing the new shiny object? And I'm guilty of that. Very guilty. But I but, try to increase my, again, my rate also, of delivery. But again, that's a, that's a valid strategy, too, is is making a lot of high-risk, high-reward bets. You know, I think of them as scratch-off lottery tickets. When you decide to be a serial entrepreneur, especially uh, one that, that picks up and sets aside as fast as uh, uh, Andrew has, um, the, the, the good news is that, you know, you vastly increase your chances of suddenly hosting a series in primetime, uh, A&E television, but, uh, oh, yeah. but and like, you know, the 3d printing thing was like, I was fascinated by this area and it got me back into sort of the building thing sort of phase. And a lot of times I jump in this was like, oh, I'm going to learn, I'm going to do something. And that led me to a project, which at some other point I'll be able to talk about I've got, I've got to, I work, you know, one day a week with, you know, three other people on a really, really cool project. And that came from this thing led to this other thing. And sometimes you don't know where it'll go. But if you if it's like, guys, I'm going to pick up something entirely different. My my barometer is, is anything getting done? Is anything getting done? And I'm you know, I've got I've had two books come out this year. Audiobook of Station Breaker is now available, by the oh, way. And uh, uh, the next book in there uh, is going to be available in a couple weeks. So this I'm like, I feel like, OK, my productivity as far as getting things released. I got a new magic trick out. Look, so I, things look, are getting wait, released. Let me, let, me then, just, let me just point that out. Hold that up again. That is an audiobook version of a ebook that 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 posts the 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 first publishing deal. Andrew wrote and said, You wanna know what? I'm going I'm 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 gonna just put it out on Amazon the way that I did before, you know, for forget a publisher. That art is Andrew's art that he did uh uh for uh for for the ebook. And now he is again. He is partnering with somebody to put this stuff out because yeah, uh, Tantor, Tantor Audio, which is an actual legit publisher, you know, audiobook publisher, that paid me money for the publishing rights to go do this. Um, so and then I have you know Orbital. So yeah, I mean, I I I made sure that when I dive, dove into books and stuff, that I would see things through, that I would see things to completion and stuff. And sometimes that can be difficult. The book that I have coming out in September from Amazon with uh, Thomas and Mercer, Thomas and Mercer, the publisher. You know, that was a book that was it would have been easier to give up on, but I believed in it, my agent believed in it, and then Thomas and Mercer believed in it, and now that's another series. And so like I would say that, you know, my 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 rate of delivering things, I feel pretty good because I actually wrote three books. Two books already came out. Orbital came out earlier in the year, then Blackfall and The Naturalist comes out, and then I've got lined up for next year at least Looking Glass and maybe a couple other things. So I feel like my productivity rate in there is good. And but I but it's like I'm going to say this and it's going to sound – it doesn't take me a long time to write a book, so I've been looking for other things to do with my time. <laughs> uh, by the way, I know what I just did is bought Station Breaker and now I'm downloading it right now to my iPhone. Cool. I hope you dig it. Station Breaker is amazing. You will really, really, really enjoy Station Breaker. But listen, I mean, again, listen to what Andrew just said. 
I, I'm, I'm, I'm publishing three books this year. It'll, it'll probably be more than Andrew forgot to mention his uh, uh, involvement in what the, the Predator anthology, right? Oh yeah. Uh, that's coming out this year. And and it's like, yeah, but you want to know what? Those don't really take me all that long. And I did a lot of them last year or the year before. So what am I doing now? What am I doing now? And like, that's again, that's that's like to me. That is that is the example. That is that is the bar. So uh, uh, I, I have I have tried to live my life as a a a a, a Mr. Pibb to Andrew Maine's Dr. Pepper uh, uh, productivity level. I, I mean, again, and you, you're doing a great job, and I think you've improved upon the formula. You know, last year, last year was I decided to learn get, get to learn a programming language and learn stuff, and that's why I picked up Ruby and Rails. This year has been, let me dig into app development and I and delivery because also I'm like, you know what? Because I said what I need is, I like books were a great I could create a thing, conceive a thing, put it on an ebook and deliver it to people. I'm like, you know what? If programming something I want to do, then I need to figure out how to get from start to finish. Now, years ago, I created games for like the iPhone using game kits, but I didn't really, you know, I just use kits to put them together. I didn't get any hard coding. Um, and that's for me. I like to find things now that I can do be- the beginning, middle and end and see that all the way through to delivery. And, and, that's, and that, I have to choose projects at that scale or else they won't get done. That's and that's crucial, because if yeah. there's anything that I think I've taken the most away from you, Andrew, is that. Life is not the one idea. Life is the 360. It's the idea, production, the, the, the massaging of the idea to get it to where it needs to be, the, the, you know, the, the realization that real art is shit, right? And so mm-hmm. how do I make this? What's the best avenue to do it? What's the best avenue to market it? How do we uh, gauge success when it's out there? And then how do we move forward? Is this a one-off or do you keep going? And if, if you're not, the, the greatest creative trap we can have is is believing that, you know, like <laughs> like the idea. I, I love the fact that Arrested Development had, you know, Job have the, the the line like, oh, I'm an idea man, Michael, to reveal that to be kind of the, the, the fraudulent phrase that it is, you mm-hmm. know, because there is no worth to being the idea man. No. Right. There is there is worth to creating. There is worth to bringing things into the world. And, you know, uh, uh, once you for all anybody wants to say, oh, you tried this and it didn't work or you tried this and it wasn't great, man, you walk that line and you got to the end of it. And now you are so much better for it than outthinking yourself from the very beginning. You know, yeah, it's the- that uh, uh yeah the, <laughs> the idea man thing and like I'm trying to find a kind way to say it, but yeah that when I hear people say a various that I'm like that's that is the the laziest least I want to do anything possible sort of thing anybody can say yeah. I just want to have I just want to do the easy part of just thinking something up and then make somebody else go do, get yeah, I can have somebody else go do it. it's like okay so you want to have you don't want to put the sweat into making it happen. Imagine if Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk were like, I'm just the idea guy. You know, Jeff Bezos is like, I got an idea for a thing called Amazon. I think it'd be really, you know, read people, I had this idea, like, what'd you do? Well, you know, a lot of people had an idea for e-commerce. Jeff Bezos made it work. You know, I, I had a friend tell me once, like, I th- they, they told, describing themselves, like, I think I'm kind of a lot like Elon Musk and kind of have these ideas. I'm like, no, you're nothing like him. He makes these things happen, you know, or, you know, or you and I sit around at Denny's talking about these things. This guy's out yeah. there doing stuff. And, and that's the thing to think about is think about what did Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk and Steve Jobs all have in common and what sets them apart from everybody else is that they became billionaires and they still did the thing they do. Jeff Bezos is on his way to be the richest man in the world. And he shows up in an office every day and he does the job. That he set out for himself. Warren Buffett, Bill Gates. Well, Bill Gates sort of tired, but like Warren Buffett, one of the richest men on the planet. Same thing. He's got a job to do. He goes and does it. He's got billions of dollars. It is really not about the money at this point. It is seriously not about the money at this point. People are like, oh, they want more. I'm like, no, you. It was, is it 15 billion? Is it 17 billion? I forget. Doesn't matter. It is because they're so focused on what they're doing that the work is the thing. I, that's why we'll, most of us will never be rich. Because or that level, because the first chance we get to cash out, because if that's the goal, that's what we do, not build something big and great. Yep. So, 
Agreed. Idea men are worth 10 to 20% at best. I, I think you're off by a margin of 10. Yeah, possibly 20. <laughs> like, <laughs> ideas are literally free and raining around you. Just, yeah, you want an idea? Take a cab. How about that? Then you got plenty of ideas. Uh, but what you'll get yeah. is somebody who also has a lot of reasons why he can't get around to doing his thing. Yeah. Uh, beware, beware reasons. Perfectly good reasons. Yeah, uh, the more creative you are, the better you are at creating them. Hey, man, I got to pick. It's right. Justin's Kickstarter on Friday. Action news is this Friday. Everybody needs to buy it and do it on Friday. That's the purpose of the Kickstarter is you kick the start. Kickstarter. Yeah, going for that. Uh, well, I don't know. We got a, we got a, like a, I think we might have a link, but it's like, <laughs> it's, it's, a, uh, it's like, oh, we're, we're screwing around with it. So it's, it's not finished, but. Uh, yeah, Action News. The game from the folks who brought you the contender comes uh, what is effectively Anchorman the game. Uh, you use real news stories to create wacky television news scripts. Uh, it, uh, we're very proud of the, uh, of, of, the, of the mechanic for it, and everybody on this show will be receiving their demo copies within the next two to three days. So, oh, uh, yeah. Uh, we'll 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 get all of that, and uh, I, I I can't I can't say enough about how much I love the design and how proud I am of the team. It's uh, <laughs> what I saw looked beautiful. What I saw looked great. It looked so good. You know, it, it's funny now it, it, because the gender dynamics are are what they are. But uh, Brian will be able to appreciate that. It feels like now we are in. The, uh, the 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 delivery stages of of pregnancy, uh, which is funny because Meg and Fawn, our our design team, are women, and John and I are men, and we are like now it's very tense, and maybe a lot of people are saying things that they don't exactly mean, but it's just we're we're like everyone wants to get it right, so uh, uh, so when when I, I like this gets... metaphor because I I'm assuming that it's also you're getting every outsider giving you advice that that is. Super not helpful, not going to be implemented. You already have a plan. You're sticking to it. You know, it's like, oh, you should give an all natural water birth. Water birth is the way to go. Have you called the water birth people? You can get a doula. They can sing a song for you. You know, it's funny. We uh, we were talking with our friend uh, Mikey Newman, who launched his uh, very, very, very successful Patreon for movies with Mikey. And he was talking about. How funny it was that uh, all anybody could give him when he was asking for advice on his Patreon was very strident, very confident advice uh, to the point of maybe even, you know, calling names and and uh, and using very harsh language when it came to some of his decisions, uh, which uh, rang increasingly hollow as his Patreon made more than theirs. Uh, that 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 birth such amazing strident advice uh for them so it's like it's it's hard it's running this one has been as hard if not harder than uh than previously and, and to be honest you know your 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 uh, estimation is certainly correct but I, I haven't looked for advice to be honest uh, and and i haven't to the point where i haven't talked to you guys about it as much as I probably talked to uh, you guys about the last one, you know, uh, not because I don't value your guys' opinion. There's really no two people on the planet that I value, uh, you know, more, uh, but just because there's so much internal, you know, kind of uh, uh, deliberation. On, well, on Justin, let me tell you how to run a Kickstarter at this <laughs> point. Well, I mean, uh, that's 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 a very, very valid point, because it's like I know. I, 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 you know, when you first started this, I had theoretical knowledge, you had theoretical knowledge, then you did it, and then you got practical real knowledge of this. And, and, and I could certainly weigh in a little bit like, oh, there's a, you know, potential buyer, maybe this or this or this, but you already, and that's the problem too, is like sometimes you enter into some things, be like, oh, we've got suggestions, like, that's great. I've got a hundred. I've got a hundred things I got to get through. And, and yours might actually be in here and solve that problem, but it's like, sure. Yeah, let me do the thing I'm gonna do, and I, I have that. I have I, it. Kind of sometimes I get a little annoying because be like, well, you know, I'm like, you see something that's not not fully working. I, I get that, but don't treat it like I'm like, why isn't this working? Doop 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 doo. You know, it's like I'm I'm 
I've got a list. Let me get through the list because right now having to manage people telling me what to do, yeah, is it something I want to put at the top of the list? And and that's the thing is is I'm I'm one of four, you know, and mm-hmm. and everybody's got an opinion inside, you know, and so now any advice that I take on the outside needs to go through, you know, the, the house of representatives in my head to determine whether or not we're going to bring it to the floor of the, of, of the Senate, uh, to graduate, to be signed by the white house. That is my mouth to our own, you know, decision-making process, you know, and, and it's, it's, uh, uh I don't know if I can mix any more metaphors into my, uh, into my it's bowling, throw bowling into the mix. Is there any bowling parts? Bowling Alone uh, uh, by Robert Putnam. Um, so, yeah, I, I, it's it's hard, you know, and, and we're we're hopefully over the, a bit of the hump now as we're getting, you know, through the, the video and everything. But uh, the, the goal is to just take every lesson that we learned from the last one and turn all those up to 11 and try to maximize uh, everything we possibly can. And that's what this week is is just putting all that together and cashing in all my favors if i ever did you a favor then get ready for i'm sliding into all the dms this week it's just the one after another hey man what's going on yeah absolutely man i'll think about it <laughs> gentlemen i'm just gonna double down my pick as action news yeah Hey, uh, my my pick is uh, the uh, is, is the modern rug Patriot. Ha. Yeah, the funny thing, like the only conversation we had, like I was like, oh man, you should call it fake news. You should call it fake news. You should we call it fake news? We're going to action news. Uh, okay, anyhow, I mean, it was one of those like sometimes just somebody will have a suggestion that they seem really insistent on, they don't really care about, but it's like, oh, this would be cool. But that's yeah, really it. Yeah, and that, believe you me, that was something that we talked about a lot. We talked about whether to call it fake news uh, uh, a lot, and ultimately we, we kind of made that decision to go away from it. Better than you did. Better news. than you did. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because horrible. I gave you horrible advice. Horrible <laughs> well, advice. I mean, it was really it was just that we didn't want it to seem political, mm-hmm. like yeah. uh, and and you know because uh, we still don't know whether or not I mean, how much the politics thing helped and hurt us the last time. So we wanted to try yeah. to do it without it. And that wasn't oh. the aesthetic. Yeah. Gentlemen. It's been after. Yeah. Sweet. Good shows. Awesome. Good shows, guys. And I just want to put a moratorium on any genitalia being shown in between shows. Just, uh, <laughs> just, uh, that w- I was tricked into that. Uh, that, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's that's a it's a it's a violation of the old TOS. Well, no one saw it. <laughs> I mean, for, it for the happen. record, I wasn't able to spot any nipples. If, if oh, that matters. Uh, <laughs> actually, uh, the Dick. Twitch terms of service don't prohibit nudity. It just it can't be the central focus. Uh, hey, codes from home. Fake news can be the contender. Action news crossover expansion. That idea is free. False. You stole it from us because that actually there is an expansion that will be part of the Kickstarter where you can play the uh, uh, a, a round of contender then followed by the round table discussion oh that's brilliant of, of the news it won't be called fake news but uh, uh but but that is going to be part of the kickstarter call it no puppet no puppet no puppet, no puppet. hey this is me i'm the president of the united states <laughs> i'm not the marionette here hey this is we are going to make I'm america your so president cool. too Yes, I'm the president. A lot of evil though that that's it sounds exactly like him. That, that they, wasn't they, a recording at all. It was all of us doing yeah. our <laughs> was, that wasn't a recording. That was us really doing an impression of the president. <laughs> Alright guys. Uh Hotline Monday? You doing Hotline Monday, Josh? Later. I gotta turn on my AC. It's burning. All right. All right. Bye. 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 Hotline Monday will not happen as I gotta figure out uh why I'm in constant fucking pain with my uh with whatever this thing in my leg is oh, so Jesus. hopefully it'll be either fixed or i'll get some like sweet sweet muscle relaxers that will uh <laughs> will alleviate the constant leg pain that i'm in lately all right well uh hopes and prayers for the next hour instead of hotline hopes monday and hopes and prayers and then cord killers in two hours we'll see you guys later peace